Hey everybody, it's JJ and we're back again for another ASUS PC DIY Hardware live stream. Hopefully everybody's uh, wrapping up the week on a positive and productive footing. Uh, it's me, JJ, and um, we've got actually a number of really cool things to actually talk about this actually this week. So um, what are we going to be talking about? Well, first and foremost, uh, we're actually going to be touching on a brand new actually feature that we're introducing in GPU Tweak 3, which I'm actually going to be showing you guys in a demo. It's a really cool level of functionality that we have that gives you full real-time mobile view on your mobile-based devices. Um, so we're actually going to be doing that. Um, also going to be talking actually about some new upcoming products that we've got. So we actually got a new addition to our ROG gaming chair lineup. So I'll be giving you a little bit of a teaser of that. We've got a brand new Tough Gaming 4070 Ti Tough Gaming graphics card, but in white. So this is a follow-up to our actually prior uh, Tough Gaming uh, Radeon RX GPU that we recently released in white. So we've got another limited edition white Tough Gaming based graphics card that we're gonna have. Um, We've also, of course, got brand new updates for AMD's latest generation, of course, HEDT platform. So, of course, for the Threadripper, Threadripper Pro series of CPUs, there's the WRX90 chipset, and then you have the, uh, of course, the TRX50 based chipset. So, we're going to be talking about both of those motherboards, and we'll initially show you pretty much the majority of the information and the key specifications on the TRX50, with a little bit more to come for the WRX90 in the not too distant future. Uh, and then a couple of other things sprinkled in, including, of course, the PC DIY Builder Spotlight. Speaking of the PC DIY Builder Spotlight, Let's see who we have joining us in today's stream. We've got the one, the only Snuff Computer Design, one of the best builders and modders in the game. And we're actually going to be checking out his build today in the PC DIY Builder Spotlight. So very cool to have him here. Got Erica joining us as always. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us, Erica. And thanks for letting us know that the audio is a thumbs up. We've got uh, Harid Dar joining us. I think that's the first time I might have seen you joining us in the stream here. Got the one, the only PGPCs, a fantastic member of our PC DIY community and a cool and upcoming uh, PC builder. Uh, let's see who else we've got joining us here. Um, uh, let me see here. Um, so let's see. Nelson Lopez is also joining us. We got Sumin joining us. We've got Mike uh, Russo joining us. Uh, Michelle joining us. Uh, the other Michael, of course, from up north as well. And uh, I think that rounds out initially who I can see right here joining us in the chat. But fantastic to have you guys all joining us here on the stream. So let's get ready to go ahead and jump into it. We've got some cool stuff to touch on and we'll go from there. So uh, first things first, let's go ahead and quickly just give you guys a little bit of an update in terms of UEFI BIOS announcements. So we've actually gone ahead and been rolling out a number of different updates for both AM4 and for actually Socket 1700 series. So of course, this is one of the latest Socket 1700 series motherboards. This is the Mac Maximus Z790 Dark Hero, uh, but we actually have a number of updates that are not only coming out for the new refresh series boards, so essentially their upcoming formal second wave UEFI, um, but we also have some updates for prior 1700 series, which of course align with the 14th gen series CPU release. In addition to that, for the AM4 platform, there's a number of motherboards that you're going to be seeing that are receiving essentially the latest AMD Agisa. Now, as I always kind of try to preface out there, uh, for those of you that essentially have um, AM4 based motherboards, um, if you're going to be making the update, keep in mind that, of course, anytime you make any changes to the AMD Agisa, that can change underlying auto rules. Um, it can change a lot, quite a number of different parameters. So if your system is running essentially stable and reliable without any issues, there's no reason for you to go ahead and upgrade. Uh, the majority of essentially the latest updates, um, if we roll back a couple of releases on AM4, are going to probably be tackled specific to USB interoperability and compatibility, um, fine-tuning essentially some, some compatibility elements for maybe newer devices that are coming to the market. Uh, but as it's a very mature platform for the really the majority of users there's no immediate reason for you just to update the UEFI so uh, unless you're maybe building a brand new system there's probably no immediate reason for you to jump into the UEFI release if you've got more questions as always too I recommend that you check out actually our full post guide that we have in the PCDIY white group which actually will have all of the motherboards that we have the UEFI releases for the last week as well as it has an FAQ which pretty much gives you all the ins and outs, letting you know kind of what's going on um, in terms of all the ins and outs for updating your UEFI BIOS, what happens if it's a beta BIOS, um, you know, if I have overclocking, do I have RAID enabled? There's all kinds of questions that we have in there that are already answered to help you really kind of have an understanding of what's kind of going on in relation to your system. Uh, let me go ahead and quickly see if I can bring up my UEFI BIOS notes file and just to kind of check the number of boards that we have here for that update. So give me one second. And uh, we'll see here. So got my log file up and we'll see which boards we have. So a total looks like there's about 45 motherboards that have the corresponding updates. And 
just to give you kind of a quick recap, pretty much all of the refresh motherboards will have a new essentially release UEFI that will be out there. Um, and then for again, the second prior generation seven, socket 1700 series boards, um, the dash E, the dash F, the dash A, the dash I, the dash H, um, all under the ROG Strix lineup got the update. Uh, ProArt Z790, the ProArt B760 creator. Um, then on the AMD side up, AMD side of the fence, you're seeing essentially a wide number of the B450 based motherboards and B550 and X570 series based motherboards all essentially got accompanying updates. So again, you can head over to the actual motherboard in question, check to see its corresponding update and you'll be good to go. Um, I'll go ahead and show you guys just as a reference example, kind of what I'm referring to if you want to see. So let me go ahead and bring up a model here. Hopefully this UEFI build will already be up for this model. Some of them take about 24 hours for them to synchronize on the back end, but we'll see. So here would be one of the AM4 boards. This is our Tough Gaming B550 Plus Wi-Fi 2. Okay, so we're gonna head over to the support tab, which is what you would do, head over to the driver tab, BIOS and firmware, and we can see right here, yep, all one of the most recent boards. Uh, you can see from, uh, excuse me, the 23rd of this month, and that new AMD Agisa, that 1.2.0.b release, okay? Um, so again, no need to worry essentially if your system's already running without any issues, but if you are maybe putting together a new system, maybe you haven't updated in quite some time, maybe you're looking to maximize, like I said, interoperability compatibility, um, or like I said, maybe you were previously existing those USB-based issues, you can consider updating. Um, as always though, again, Keep in mind that if you're overclocking, you would want to retune your overclock specific to the new uh, UEFI. I also recommend installing updated chipset drivers after you update any core uh, UEFI BIOS update. All right, so that takes care of that, guys. Um, we're going to go ahead and get ready to jump into the next item. So give me one second here. See if we've got any quick questions that might have came up in relation to that. Uh, and change the motherboard to the dark here. Um, I didn't change it. Actually, this is just because I was having this system set up. So I still actually have my other demo system there. I don't know if I'll end up changing over from before. Or if you guys remember, I had the Maximus Extreme to where I had the Prime uh, Z790-A. And so here, just because I had a reposition for this GPU T3 demo that I was going to be doing, um, I had a different kind of setup. And so I figured, oh, I'll just kind of put the dark here right there. But I, I don't know if maybe I'll, I'll, I'll change this again. So we'll see. Um, Chris S is asking, is it best to update the BIOS even if I don't need it for 14th gen series CPUs? That's actually a really great question. Um, and I'll, in my opinion, I would say no. The uh, UEFI BIOS maturity was already very, very good for Z690 and for Z790 for both 12th and 13th gen series CPUs. And there is actually a little bit of difference sometimes in what's called the memory training policy or the memory auto rules. So you actually could find in some situations you might get maybe a little bit better DRAM scaling or sometimes a little bit better uh, performance scaling, uh, especially for DRAM, maybe for like 13th gen than you would under a 14th gen series UEFI. Um, in most situations, we generally try to pretty much keep things analogous and we try to ensure pretty much the UEFI update is overall a positive uplift, but there is always going to be generally a breaking point where usually you want to attempt to optimize for the newer architecture and for the newer CPU, right? Um, and so in that respect, of course, with 14th gen refresh series motherboards, their focus, of course, was being in alignment with 14th gen. So we're really maximizing the UEFI and the interoperability specific for those CPUs, right? So again, if you have a very stable and reliable system, I wouldn't recommend it. Now, in the future, you may still potentially see UEFI releases that may contain maybe like a security mitigation update that might be issued by Intel, which is also sometimes uh, going to include an, a management engine firmware update. Um, in that situation, it's up to you whether you kind of want to take advantage of uh, essentially enabling that security fix or that security patch if it's enabled within the UEFI. But like I said, it could potentially come at the expense of maybe a little bit of performance tuning. But I'll tell you realistically, these are generally going to be on the edge cases. So the nominal difference could maybe be like a couple of hundred megahertz in terms of DRAM clocking. Um, but if you're not running, you know, 7600 memory, you, you probably wouldn't even notice the difference, right? So if you're running like a 6000, 64, 6600 kit or something like that, even a 7000 uh, MT kit, you probably wouldn't notice the difference between, let's say, a more kind of optimized 14th gen series based UEFI to like a 13th gen series UEFI. So overall, the experience will pretty much be the parity. You won't really notice too much of a difference, okay? So hopefully that answers that question. All right. Um, Harid goes, um, so I have a flash drive from the Hero board. Can I use it to update the BIOS? I'm not sure exactly what you mean by can I use that to update the BIOS? 
I mean, all the Maximus motherboards support updating the UEFI BIOS using the USB BIOS flashback feature. So that means you can take a flash drive, you can plug it into the port and you can hold down this button and you can update it that way. But if your system's up and running, um, you know, for me personally, I just use Easy Flash. So I'll just put the flash file actually on my SSD um, or you can put it to a flash drive and then I'll use Easy Flash inside the UEFI BIOS to navigate to the actual directory and flash it that way. Um, but if you want to use USB BIOS flashback, sure, you can go ahead and do that. It doesn't really matter. There's not an advantage using one over the other, right? Um, USB BIOS flashback is really most advantageous maybe when you're first setting up your system um, because you don't have to have the CPU, you don't have to have the memory, you don't even have to have the graphics card installed to update the UEFI BIOS, right? You can just do it directly from the flash drive and then holding down the button, okay? Um, Namor is asking, what if I want to have an improved system? I don't know what you mean by improved system. Uh, just because you have the new UEFI doesn't mean that you improve anything. Again, the UEFI updates might not even conditionally provide you any actual benefit, right? Let's, let's say if that UEFI update uh, specifically incorporates new interoperability and compatibility support for maybe um, a new, let's say like M.2 SSD or something like that, and you don't have that SSD in your system, it doesn't do anything to your system. So you're not improving performance, right? There's zero net benefit. Um, even if we actually also include maybe DRAM overclocking improvements, but you have your system essentially underneath that overclocking threshold of where we're making the improvements, again, you don't get any performance uplift, right? So in my experience, what I would say is if your system is running with stability and reliability, there's no reason for you to update just arbitrarily just to update. Some people like to just update just because they want the newer build to run the newer build. That's of course entirely your choice, but the reality is, is that because you can have complex changes to underlying auto rules, you could actually go from having a system that could be entirely stable to actually a system that might not be stable, especially if it's overclocked. Generally, if you're going from stock to stock operation, you probably wouldn't notice any difference at all. Um, so that is kind of just something to keep in mind. All right. Hopefully that makes sense. Right. All right. Um, so I think that answers that question from there. Let's go ahead and keep moving things along. Give me one second here, guys. All right. And again, uh, we are going to be doing the demo for the GPU Tweak 3 in a little bit. So first, we're going to go ahead and, like I said, tackle just some of the new product announcements. So let's go ahead and get those out of the way. All right. So um, I think first things first, uh, let's go ahead and give you guys a little bit of a teaser on something that I guess is going to be coming up. So let me see right here. Um, should be able to have this right here. Okay. So this is something that I can tell you guys, you'll be seeing it in the not too distant future. Some of you might have remembered um, maybe a prior actually post about it back ar around Computex time frame, but it is going to be coming. That is right. The ROG thermal paste. So um, I don't have all the details to give you yet. Don't worry. We're going to give you all you guys all the details soon, but uh, it is going to be coming. There it is. That's that ROG thermal paste. I can't tell you that there's actually going to be uh, two variants. We will have like a premium kit and then we will have the standard essentially syringe. So just the thermal paste within the actual syringe tube itself. Um, but there'll be some more information that'll be coming uh, to kind of give you guys a little bit more details in terms of some of the cool stuff that we're doing in terms of the thermal compound. But the, those of you who have been looking to kind of supplement uh, your course cooling experience, not only with something like an ROG cooler, um, but also maybe even ROG thermal paste. Well, guess what? It's going to be coming in the not too distant future. So just make sure to keep it tuned to the PCDIY group and also make sure to go ahead and keep it tuned to our weekly streams here. And of course, you're going to find out about it. Um, maybe I think for the launch, I'm trying to see if I can coordinate with our product team. Maybe we'll do like a big community giveaway. Maybe we'll give away like, you know, 25 pieces or something like that so that we can go ahead and have a whole bunch of you guys uh, try it out in the community uh, and we'll go from there. So, uh, but I'll also, I think, be covering some more kind of information. In general, a lot of people talk about thermal compound, and there's some stuff that people, I think, are confused about, some things that people don't have a clear understanding on, including things like ratings, uh, the composition, the difference between the matrix and between the filler, um, you know, things like viscosity, things like pump out, uh, lifespan. There's a lot of different kind of elements and kind of pros and cons, and also just some, you know, very easy to understand uh, kind of realities that I think sometimes people also overthink in terms of the merit. So I actually tell a lot of people, if you already have a thirst, the thermal compound that comes with any of our AIOs, there's actually no reason to replace it. Um, yes, you could potentially get a thermal compound, which might provide a little bit better thermal performance, but the reality is what we already include is already actually rated for the performance that we've already tested for. It has a long lifespan adherence to it. It has minimal pump out. It has good viscosity. So there's very little value to for you to go ahead and consistently just be reapplying it, right? So um, 
there's a lot of things that we'll go ahead and cover, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll dedicate that maybe to even just a dedicated live stream, just talking a bit about kind of thermal compound, thermal interface materials, right? And then also, like I said, this upcoming ROG thermal pace. But with that, like I said, make sure to keep it tuned. We'll be talking about that in the not too distant future. Okay, so that covers the ROG thermal paste. All right, uh, next up here, let's go ahead and get also into um, another update. So let's get into the first one here, which is gonna be an update in terms of our graphics cards. And this is gonna be for the Tough Gaming GeForce RTX 4070 Ti, but it is going to be in white. So let's go ahead and take a look at this graphics card. This will be an addition to the graphics card series. Now I'm not gonna go into all the details yet uh, because this has not actually yet rolled out in terms of our channel availability. So uh, when we actually roll it out in terms of channel availability, we'll be touching on again on in the stream. Uh, we'll of course give you guys the price point if it will be limited to certain channel partners, uh, whether or not it will be a limited production or whether it will be a standard production based graphics cards, as well as maybe some of the other spot information. But keep in mind, you can go back and pretty much watch our 4070 Ti introduction stream to find out about all the specific design benefits benefits of the tough gaming models, let's say compared to like the RG Strix models, compared to the dual models, whichever models that we have. Uh, because here, this will be exactly the same as the uh, essentially black model, the black silver kind of mo model versus uh, the white model, okay? So here we can take a look at the graphics card. Um, it's got a really nice ID design. Of course, you maintain the metal shroud just like what we have with the, of course, the non-white edition. Um, something you'll see even compared though to a lot of people that will end up modding their cards or painting them is they don't usually, of course, paint the fans because that's quite challenging. So you'll see that here we've really kind of elevated the white design. So you not only have that really nice white shroud, but even the fans are also white. And these, of course, are high performance uh, axial tech. Uh, base fan so they have a static pressure optimized design with a nice ring barrier as well on the fan. I think it looks really really nice. Again we maintain very minimal RGB lighting on the Tough Gaming series so you can see there's just two small RGB lighting zones. Um, this allows you to see just a little bit of RGB whether you have it in the vertical or whether you have it in the horizontal um, mounting position. So in the chat why don't you guys let me know are you team horizontal or team vertical? Which one are you in terms of which way do you like to orientate your GPU? Okay, uh, of course there's a full backplate on the back of the graphics card as well. That's also metal, has a really nice uh, white design. So if you do go with that horizontal base design, you're gonna see that nice white accent that you're gonna have on the backplate. Then you'll see a little bit of the white on the side profile. Overall, I think it's gonna look really nice regardless again, whether you go vertical or whether you go horizontal with the mounting of the graphics card. Uh, of course, you can see those nice tough gaming base fans. Uh, nice same IO configuration. Many graphics cards actually on the market don't generally have two HDMI, so that is kind of a little bit more of a differentiation point, differentiation point for ASUS is we have two HDMI ports, and then you can sort of see three D, uh, DP ports. And there's a little bit more of that kind of side profile design uh, where you can see, like I said, you've got that nice internal ribbing design. That ribbing design actually helps to um, add rigidity and stability to the entirety of the frame. So it reduces something that's called torsion. It also helps to mitigate card sag. So that's also a nice kind of benefit of that type of design. Some manufacturers will see the shroud is actually decoupled. And so actually the shroud itself actually will sometimes be pulling away from the PCB and it adds actually more stress to the PCB. It can cause the PCB to actually subtly crack. It can even actually cause torsion against some of the surface mount components at a time. Um, so this type of actually design is advantageous in terms of just like, again, maintaining containing uh, less torsion on the graphics card, which can be a positive element. Uh, of course, high quality PCB design with high quality power components that are on there. This utilizes, of course, the same advanced production process that all of our graphics cards use, which is the ASUS Auto Extreme production process. Um, we're the only manufacturer to unilaterally do a, uh, a SMT uh, automated production on all of our graphics cards. So it doesn't matter whether you buy $150 graphics card from us or the most expensive ROG Matrix 4090, every single one gets produced using our ASUS Auto Extreme production process. Okay, uh, another little thing that you guys might notice that's actually pretty cool um, is we do actually do a, a pretty cool, um, nice high quality matte PCB. Uh, it's a higher quality uh, look and finish to the PCB. You won't ever notice it, but uh, I do like having that nice matte PCB on the card. And then your included extras, uh, your, of course, your little uh, smartphone holder, essentially, or stand there for your phone. Um, you get a, a um, hook and loop fastener, so that's an, a cable wrap. And then you uh, get your screwdriver and your GPU support, okay? So those are going to be all your included items. And then, of course, your, uh, essentially, your uh, trading card, right? So those are going to be all the items with the Tough Gaming 4070 Ti in white. I think it looks great. What do you think, guys? Okay, 
Uh, let me go ahead and quickly see any quick questions that might have came up with there. Uh, tech says horizontal. I'm with tech. I like horizontal in terms of that. Uh, PGP sees is that it's a very looking, very looking, excuse me, a very good looking card. Uh, for Ninja Toads uh, says he's also team horizontal. All right, horizontal. Uh, Neymar Braun is also saying horizontal. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Look, we got horizontal, horizontal, horizontal. We didn't get any verticals yet. Um, so our GPU is eight layers. Actually, it entirely depends on the GPU. Different GPUs have different layer counts. Um, so the actual ROG Strix model is actually a higher PCB layer count. Um, so there's not kind of a standard. It's very similar to actually kind of motherboards. Depending on the segment of the series, you can actually have different layer counts. Uh, the highest end GPUs in the lineup actually go upwards of 14 layers in terms of their PCBs. Um, so it's... It, again, it kind of just depends on the segment of the GPU, right? Um, are we attempting to kind of fine tune signal margins, which could help to improve maybe a little bit of clock stability or scaling for overclocking? Um, there's a lot of kind of variables within it, but uh, by default, you can't necessarily just say just because it's a certain GPU class that you know the number of layers. Very similar, like I said, to a motherboard. A motherboard, it could be a six layer PCB, or it could be an eight layer PCB, or it could be a 12 layer PCB. It just depends. Okay. Oh, Su Min's throwing in his vote there for vertical. All right, all right. Hey, I think vertical can look really good. You know, um, you know. I, I, again, overall, I tend to prefer horizontal because also I I like that it doesn't obstruct any slots on a motherboard. So if I want to go ahead and quickly be able to access another PCI slot or an M.2 SSD slot or something like that, I don't have to potentially remove the whole graphics card, remove a ribbon cable, do all this other stuff just to be able to get access to a slot. So, um, you know, I think it ultimately all comes down to your build, your preference, and what do you like in terms of aesthetics, right? So both of them are there. Hey, Pete, um, I don't know what your issues are um, as far as whatever your issues are, but feel free to go ahead and report that to our service and support team or visit the actual uh, ROG forums. We have a dedicated, actually, thread there for actually our software suite and it's monitored by a dev team. Uh, you can go ahead and actually uh, export a log file within the utility, but um, you know, right now we have 35 million active users. And I would say that from a feature and functionality and stability standpoint, it's quite robust and it's actually quite stable in terms of the overall user experience. Um, I actually follow up internally with not only our system integrators, but our beta control book and outside of my own demo systems where I've got, you know, sometimes up to six to eight different demo systems, they're all running smoothly without any issues. So, so there are a lot of challenges when it comes to software feedback though, because there's so many different permutations. You could have different drivers, you got different environments, maybe you changed over your board, maybe you've got other contending software on there. So there's always different pieces of kind of information that we have to look at when we're debugging uh, users kind of issues they might be experiencing. But like I said, feel free to go ahead and reach out to our services support team, um, include that log file, and we can hopefully look into whatever it is you, it is that you're experiencing and hopefully we can uh, resolve that, okay? All right. Um, Hey, Jeremy, I'm sorry to hear that. Again, if you have any more specific feedback that actually you can provide any tangible details um, that we can look at more closely to help to provide to our, our team uh, from a product design standpoint or from whatever aspect it is you want to be able to provide feedback, uh, I'd love to go ahead and review that feedback and also share that over with our team. So you can go ahead and send that over to our service and support team, or you can also email me at pcdiyatasus.com. Okay. All right. Um, no, Harid goes, I want to release those daisy chain fans. I think I know these ones right here, right? Yeah, I was actually just trying out the Ryogen a little bit earlier. These are really cool. These are, of course, these are the fans that come with our Ryogen. Um, they have a very cool daisy chain magnetic design. So, of course, you can just do that. Uh, it's so easy. And, of course, you can just take the fans off and bam, you're good to go, right? Um, so, very, very cool. Really easy, really convenient. Uh, do definitely love those, but those are exclusive to uh, the Ryogen 3 cooler. So that is not a product that we sell uh, independently. So if you do want the uh, essentially that flexibility for your AI cooler, it is something that is exclusive right now to our, um, our Ryogen 3 uh, cooler. Whether it's the 240 model or the 360 model, the black or the white, they all come with the daisy chain magnetic fans. All right. Uh, so let's go ahead and now go into the next one. That's our Tough Gaming GeForce RTX 4070 Ti. Let's go ahead and talk about some motherboards, guys. So in terms of now another new product we're going to have, it's going to be specific on the motherboard side. So if you guys didn't see AMD's announcement, of course, they did announce the new latest generation of the Ryzen 
uh, Threadripper series of CPUs and Threadripper Pro series of CPUs. So, so these are going to be utilizing the Zen uh, 4 based microarchitecture. A really impressive beast of kind of architectural performance that you're going to be able to have here, an absolutely massive level of uh, performance. Uh, this is really going to be targeted at not really kind of gamers. This is really going to be for, of course, professionals, prosumers, people that are into science and simulation. Um, uh, they're into animation, 3D rendering, right? Topographical analysis, uh, AI and deep learning, really anything that it requires a huge number of cores, right? High frequency, high memory pools, expansive storage, and lots of flexibility when it comes to supplemental PCI lanes. So for kind of traditional users that are, might be kind of watching the stream, if you're just a gamer, this is definitely not the platform for you. Um, you would want to be taking a look at something like the AM5 platform, the AM4 platform, Intel. You could be taking a look at Z790, B760, things along those lines. This is really going to be, again, for the enthusiasts that really absolutely need the top end of the spectrum when it comes, again, to CPU core count. They also need high frequency. They need high density memory configurations. They need a lot of PCIe expansion support, storage support, kind of all of those things. This is really who these products are going to be intended for. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at the first model that we're going to touch on here, which is going to be the Pro WS TRX50 Sage Wi-Fi. So many of you might be familiar when it comes to our motherboard lineup that we have the Tough Gaming series, the RG Strix series, and then like the RG Maximus or the RG Crosshair series, depending if you're talking Intel or AMD. We also have our Prime series and our ProArt series. So that's five different series of motherboards, but some people forget about actually the WS series. WS series stands for Workstation. Uh, and we have actually both Workstation and server-based motherboards. The Workstation motherboards are specifically for that, for Workstation users, people that are essentially building a system specifically for some form of advanced production workflow. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look here at this board. Uh, we'll pull up uh, first a kind of a general image reference from it and some of the high level points and then we'll get into some of the kind of the more specifics right here. So uh, here you can see this is going to be the Pro WS TRX50 Sage. Okay. Um, and we will also then have a WRX90. Now both of these are going to be using the same socket. So regardless of whether you want to use Ryzen a Threadripper or you want to use Ryzen Threadripper Pro, the Threadripper Pro, which is more optimally suited, I would say, to the WRX90 chipset, can still be utilized on this, on the TRX50 chipset. So the socket is the same between the TRX50 as well as the WRX90. So they're essentially the same. The difference will essentially just come in some of the other elements, and I'll speak to that a little bit. One of the most immediate elements will be the level of PCI Gen 5 expansion, as well as the memory channel support. So here you have four channels on the WRX90, you have eight channels of memory. Um, but here you can see you've got five by 16 slots. So that's quite a bit more slots than you would traditionally see on a normal kind of a mainstream based motherboard, even an enthusiast based motherboard, where most of them are usually going to be one slot that's Gen 5. Only on select models, like let's say our Maximus series, might you see two Gen 5 slots. But here you can actually see that you will have six slots, excuse me, five slots, and then three are PCI Gen 5. Uh, you're then going to have three PCIe NVMe slots that are going to be on this board, but then two of them will also support PCI Gen 5. That's actually a bit more than what you would traditionally see on most motherboards. Actually, most motherboards on the market don't generally have a PCI Express Gen 5 M.2 SSD slot. That's because, uh, especially like on Intel, take for instance, there's no dedicated CPU lane from the CPU for Gen 5. So you generally have to pull the Gen 5 lanes away from graphics card lanes, which is not an issue because actually even a 4090, it's not performance limited if it runs at a by eight link, but that's just the nature of how the current configuration is. You also have a slim SAS connector. So the slim SAS connector is this little guy right here. Some people are not as familiar with this. This is kind of a flexible connector. This connector actually can support quite a number of different types of configurations, including PCI Express NVMe connectivity. So some people assume that an M.2 is the only PCIe NVMe. No, that's incorrect. Um, so you can actually have PCIe NVMe adding cards that directly slot into a PCI Express slot. You can also have ones that directly connect to this Slim SLAS connector. The other benefit of the Slim SLAS connector is going to be that you can support U.2 and U.3 based drives. And if you guys have heard me talk about U.2 and U.3, you know that I'm actually a much bigger fan of it than M.2. M.2 is a great spec, um, but it's gonna be more limited. It's gonna be thermally constrained, it's gonna be power constrained, um, and it's also going to be capacity constrained because you can only get up to eight terabytes. Uh, U.2, U.3 can actually go over 30 terabytes for a single drive. So if you also want to be able to have a much higher density, then uh, this SlimSlash connector is going to be your friend. 
Uh, it will have dual LAN, so 10G and 2.5 gigabit and Wi-Fi connectivity. It also includes Bluetooth, 20 gigabits USB-C, along with support for USB 4 via an actual Thunderbolt USB 4 add-in header. So if you take a look here, uh, down this little header right here on the motherboard, that is a special add-in header for an add-in card. Okay, and then uh, this actually board will also support some pretty cool stuff in terms of a kind of a dual PSU design. Keep in mind that the actual power envelope for these CPUs, because they can also be overclocked, is very, very high. With the highest end series CPUs, you could be looking at uh, a very high level of wattage. Now, traditionally, let's say if we compare this to, let's say, like Z790, take for instance, in most situations, you're probably talking somewhere between about 80 to maybe about 175 watts. As you start to maybe get to more demanding multi threaded workloads, you could be breaking 200 watts. In these type of platforms, you could easily be over 300 watts um, in terms of actually overclocking. Um, so we have designed the motherboards to fully allow for overclocking. You can't overclock actually the CPU and the DRAM, although keep in, keep in mind that it is not the same standard DRAM that comes on uh, traditional base platforms. Um, and we have also gone ahead and incorporated a dual PSU design, and that's to be able to provide essentially auxiliary stability um, power input for the board for overclock scenarios or for specialized work configurations if maybe you're running like a huge number of multi GPUs or accelerators or add in storage controllers or things along those lines. All right, so that is going to be the TRX 50 Sage. Um, now I want to go ahead and just quickly touch on a couple of other little points in terms of how this board will differentiate itself from the WRX 90. So let me go ahead and uh, bring up just one other image here for the uh, the Sage, and then we will go ahead and uh, talk about just some of the design differences here for WRX90. Uh, I went ahead and just kind of noted a couple of things. So um, I don't have an image yet for the WRX90 board. It will be coming out, but the Pro WS WRX90E Sage, right? That's how you know the difference. TRX50 and WRX90, okay? So these are the two models. And here, this is gonna be the TRX50, okay? And then we'll have another board, which will be the WRX90. So right now, I'm gonna be speaking about the WX, uh, excuse me, the, um, the WRX90 board, right? In comparison to this board. What are you gonna be seeing as far as some of these key differences? So let me go ahead and bring up here my just little reference chart that I made it for myself. All right, so um, one of the first things is that SIM, SIM SAS connector right here on the WRX90 board. You're gonna see that that one will have two of the SIM SAS versus one of the SIM SAS, okay? Uh, the next one is, of course, the memory channels. Here, you're gonna have four memory channels. The other one, you're gonna have eight memory channels, right? So, of course, that just means higher density memory pools. Um, in terms of the PCI Express, the WRX90 is going to have seven slots. So here you can see one, two, three, four, five. So five slots. You're going to have seven slots on the WRX90. The WRX90 is also going to have all of them be PCI Express Gen 5. Remember here, you have three that are PCI Express, PCI Express Gen 5. Okay. M.2 SSD support, you have one here, another here, and another here, so there's a total of three. And remember, those three, uh, two of them are gonna be PCI Express Gen 5 on the WRX90. The WRX90 will support four, um, and all of those will be PCI Express Gen 5. So again, if you want kind of the fastest storage, the WRX90 is gonna be more. Um, in terms of the NICs, uh, I don't have the rear I.O. here to yet show you, but in terms of the NIC interface, we talked about this one is going to be a dual NIC design. So this will give you 2.5G and 10 gigabit connectivity. The WRX90 will give you two 10G ports that are going to be on the board, plus it has a third uh, controller on there, which will be specifically for kind of what's called out-of-band management. So it has a dedicated BMAC NIC that's going to be on there. Uh, but both boards will support our ASUS Control Center Express technology, which is kind of an out-of-band management web-based interface. So you have advanced kind of monitoring and control for the motherboard. So that is going to be consistent on both of them. But there is a network specification difference. Essentially, the higher-end board is going to give you two 10G, and it also will have an advanced Intel controller, um, the uh, X, I believe, 710, uh, versus, of course, the Marvell and then Intel-based controller that's going to be on the TRX50. Um, if you remember here, I talked about this board will have not have native USB 4 support. It has 20 gigabits USB on here, so it has to have 20 gigabits USB but the WRX90 will have 40 gigabits natively on the motherboard. So we'll have that benefit as well. 
Um, in addition to that, there's also a supplemental cooling design differential. And this is also makes sense because of course it has more PCI Express Gen 5. And so there's more active load that's being placed onto the PCH as well as to the actual adjoining drives. So there will actually be a, an assist fan for the PCH and for the M.2 SSDs on the WRX90, where you actually see here, this is a passive based configuration design, okay? So um, that is gonna be most of the key differences. We'll talk a bit more. Um, I didn't really talk about also, of course, that there's some OC centric design elements where you think you have like the safe mode button, you have the retry button that's gonna be on here. You do actually even have an LN2 mode button, things along those lines, because again, this is generally gonna be a workstation, but we do see some kind of some interesting overclockers that uh, sometimes are utilizing WS boards for kind of these extreme pursuits. So that gives you a little bit of a recap in terms of what we're gonna be doing for the, uh, Pro, excuse me, uh, for the Threadripper Pro and for Threadripper series CPUs. Again, remember the socket on both of these boards supports both series of CPUs. So with that, let me go ahead and quickly just see, because I kind of went over a lot there, if we had any quick questions. Um, and we'll go from there. Um, JC is noting, will all the TRX-40Bs, yes, that's a requirement. That's part of AMD's actually requirement there as far as the RDIMM. So yes, um, the memory support is going to be different. So again, it's not your traditional uh, UDIMMs that you have on, let's say, AM5 or Z790. So you do actually have to use a different category of DIMMs. And also keep in mind that when you go to higher memory channels as well, um, generally higher memory channels, even though you will be having overclocking DRAM support, it's going to be more stressful anytime you run higher memory channels and also higher density. So again, if you care about kind of bandwidth and frequency and you really, really like DRAM overclocking, well, that is going to be possible on here. We'll talk a bit more about that once the performance embargo kind of lifts um, that, you know, you still would probably want to be focusing on the mainstream series platforms where, of course, there's less memory channels. With less memory channels, you can, of course, scale to higher levels, right? Uh, Depoets uh, thrown out here. So I was looking forward to testing out uh, the new Threadripper series. Yeah, uh, it's a really impressive part. I mean, when you talk about essentially what uh, the CPU range for the non Threadripper Pro, you're going to be looking at $1,500 to $5,000. Uh, you go all the way up to 24 cores and 48 threads. So that's really impressive, right? 24 cores and 48 threads. Um, you got the 48 lanes for PCI Express Gen 5, right? And then if you go all the way up even more, right, you can go to the 64 to the 128 threads. And then on the Pro Series CPUs, you go, what, uh, 96 cores up to 192 threads. I mean, so you talk about going from, you know, your your minimum there, right, all the way up to your highest end. That's pretty, excuse me, that's, that's pretty... That's pretty crazy uh, when you just talk about that level of performance. Uh, it's it's pretty wild, right? That one socket is going to be able to scale all the way up to that 96 cores, 192 threads, right? Pretty cool. <laughs> hey, Falcon Northwest. Fantastic. Happy to have you here, man. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sure Falcon Northwest, are you guys going to be actually doing Threadripper enabled systems? Um, so just give us one with RGV, JJ. Uh, right now, I'm not sure yet. Uh, we don't necessarily have plans to uh, roll out our Threadripper Pro support for, let's say, like our RG line. We really do think that if you take a look at kind of uh, where AM5 now sits in terms of off you, very high core count, very high thread count, high density robust PCIe storage, especially with also the E-based chipsets, which have dual chipsets, which give you even more PCI Express lanes than a traditional based platform. It does sit a very good balance of almost kind of replacing what you previously had with more entry level platforms. But here the reintroduction of, of course, I think a more entry Threadripper and then also the Threadripper Pro, them going into the same socket gives a lot of flexibility. So we'll definitely be monitoring feedback from partners like Falcon Northwest, one of the best system integrators in the game, as well as our community of users and and different people to see if we will supplement the portfolio. But as of right now, for our launch, uh, we will be focusing on these two models. So we'll have one TRX50 baseboard, and then we will have one WRX90 baseboard. Um, hey, Kiari, if I'm saying that correctly, hopefully I'm saying that right, man. Shout out. Thanks. Thanks for joining us right here. All right. Um, for Ninja Toads is asking, I've seen some of your AMD boards have HDMI on board. Why do these have HDMI on board? Um, so you might not be aware. So one of the things that transitioned from the AM4 era, so like let's say if you had like a 5600X or a 5950X or like a 3600, AMD did of course have APUs, so some of their CPUs that had integrated graphics. But unlike Intel, where pretty much all of their CPUs had integrated graphics built into them, pretty much the majority of their CPUs did not have integrated graphics. When AMD shifted over to AM5, which is their new platform, right? So those would be the Ryzen 7000 series of CPUs. AMD did pretty much 
integrate an integrated GPU. So that integrated GPU, if you're gonna take advantage of it, you would wanna have integrated graphics on the motherboard. So that is the reason why you will see integrated graphics support on pretty much all the AM5 motherboards. But even on AM4, you would still see some motherboards that did have an integrated port on there because maybe a user was gonna use in one of the APU-based series CPUs. But that's the reason why. Essentially, if you see display on the motherboard, it's for generally utilizing the integrated graphics, which is inside of the CPU, all right? Um, so, uh, William Wiseman asks, is any plans for any Strix or RG TRX 50 boards? I think I noted that question. So like I said, right now, no media plans. Like I said, right now, we're just focusing on these WS-based models. Um, again, I think we'll look to see if we get feedback from the community, if they're interested in, but I think if we look at the positioning again, even AMD would tell you, these are gonna offer extraordinarily uh, high levels of performance, but really the performance is gonna be for workloads that are really focused on, like I said, more professional use case scenarios, not under, let's say, the traditional gaming product portfolio, um, which is what we would generally be releasing something in the lungs of an RG Strix or an RG Crosshair series. And now in the past, we did have something like, of course, the Zenith series, which was in that HDAT, but that's when you still necessarily saw that sometimes the highest in CPU within the stack that was still kind of relevant for gaming was still offering you that, or maybe it was gaming and streaming. So I still think that kind of made sense. And you could definitely still say that something like one of the non-Threadripper Pro Series CPUs would still be a very, very performance system for gaming, for streaming, for content creation, for maybe a mixed kind of scenario segment. So maybe we may evaluate looking at an RG SKU, but right now the focus is gonna be on WS-based models. All right, all right, guys. So that is gonna cover us there for those um, upcoming, essentially AMD Threadripper and AMD Threadripper Pro series CPUs. All right, um, now just kind of speaking of higher end series CPUs, um, I do kind of want to show you guys a little bit of a teaser that's going to be coming in the not too distant future. So let me guys, let me show you guys something here. Just a little bit, a little, little bit of a teaser. So I think you guys uh, are aware that you know that we are going to be coming out in the not too distant future with, of course, uh, an update to our ASUS ProArt series of products with, of course, the ProArt, the PA602 chassis, and then the ProArt LC420, which will be actually our first 140 millimeter um, AIO based solution. So I'm just going to go ahead and give you guys a little bit of a teaser here on this guy. So let me go ahead and show this to you guys. Uh, this will be coming out in this in this in this quarter. So in Q4. So um, I'm not going to give you all the details on it. You guys will just have to make sure to stay tuned for an upcoming stream where we will go ahead and touch on that. But I thought, hey, why not go ahead and just uh, show you a little bit. So let's go ahead and take a little bit of a closer look here at the upcoming ProArt 420 LC AIO cooler. Um, it is going to be, I think, a great addition to this lineup. So if you're looking for something that has a really minimal, uh, excuse me, minimal design aesthetic that really complements the ProArt series of products, you can see right there just how nicely it pairs with the ProArt series based on the boards or ProArt graphics cards or the ProArt chassis. It's going to be a great addition to round out the ProArt based ecosystem. But also, again, regardless of different motherboard a different chassis it's going to be a great cooler i think to be able to supplement uh this is going to be a little bit similar to our current uh ryujin which already comes with the noctua base fans but again one of the key differences is is that the proart lc will have a 140 millimeter base noctua fans where the ryujin comes with um 120 millimeter Noctua fans. Keep in mind the Ryujin does come with two different design versions. We have the Ryujin 3, which has the new ROG daisy chain magnetic fans. So that's these fans right here, which of course you can see they're daisy chain. And then they have the single connector for both the fan and for the ARGB that goes on uh, to either uh, the left or the right hand side, right? You can go ahead and put on either side right there, right? So you can see right here, the connector, very, very easy. Um, you can go ahead and Go that route or you can go if you just don't want any rgb lighting you can go with the noctua base fans so we do have both of those versions available so in total like the ryogen there's actually six versions <laughs> there's 240 there's 360 there's white there's black and then there's noctua uh, and then there's argb so we have lots of different versions uh, Kiari goes, um, I still use the Strix LC240. Yeah, that's a great cooler. I love that cooler. I, I love the way it looks. It's a simple, clean, nice, integrated design. Um, so I'm a big fan of that model. So uh, thanks for being Team RG and Team Strix. Um, you need the other cable for the other end? Yes, that's, yeah. So yes, um, yes, for that's what he's referring to is that 
this cable right here, there's actually two different cables in the box. So there's one cable that's paired in terms of the actual polarity for one side and the other cable for the other side. So, um, but you get both cables inside the box. So it's not something you have to worry about. It's very, very simple. All right. Um, William Wiseman, do you happen to know the static uh, matrix? Um, I believe the second um, rollout array is happening happened this week and it began to roll out. Um, I don't know the status is the sell through. Um, so I don't know if it already maybe sold through in terms of the actual partners. Um, I know those partners already started to receive inventory, but I don't know if they've skewed it up and sold through on it. So I can see if I can reach out to our partners to see if we can get an inventory status check. But uh, my expectation, because the matrix has been in very, very high demand, that pretty much the moment that pretty much it gets listed up, probably within the same day, it's going to sell through in terms of overall demand because pretty much everybody is waiting on it being refreshed. And I know that the second refresh already started to come through. Um, but um, we'll do a, a status update in the PCDIY group for sure next week where we'll provide you guys visibility if there's any essentially remaining inventory that it still has to be pushed out to the channel. So if you didn't pick it up on the first launch and then the second wave refresh, if there will be a third refresh cycle. My expectation though probably is that if there is going to be a third refresh cycle, that will be the final cycle and that will pretty much sell through of all of the inventory for the matrix as it is an ultra limited production. So it pretty much won't be available uh, anymore in that regard. Okay. Yeah, William. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's just the reality, right? Is that it's a super in-demand product. Um, it's just challenging. Um, are, we are working on some, hopefully some plans in the future in terms of maybe like a potential kind of reservation system. And again, I would also recommend that you kind of reach out to the e-tailers in question, whether it's like Newegg or other channel partners that if you want to see something like that from them to uh, give you an opportunity, then also definitely do that. But that is the nature sometimes of just these limited product releases is that, you know, it is going to sometimes be a little bit of a struggle in terms of trying to be able to make sure that you can contend along with everybody else that is interested into it. Um, that is just the reality, like I said, of it being a more limited edition production as composed to, you know, something like an ROG Strix card, um, which is, you know, routinely being going to be replenished over time within the, uh, the channel inventory. But the good thing is that if we see really strong response to it, then we may continue to maybe uh, maintain maybe the matrix as we move forward where you know for a few generations we didn't actually have the matrix series right so i think this was also kind of retesting the waters to kind of see if the community is still really interested in seeing that type of kind of gpu offering um, even like i said if it's in a more select category because keep in mind even between our current rog strix we also then have the strix lc series which are the ones with the integrated ai solutions and then the matrix was kind of like even beyond that right because it was offering a much more stylized uh, ID design, it had an entirely different cold block, right? It had the liquid metal application, right? It had a thicker radiator. Um, you know, there was an entirely different actually level of hardware design to be able to do the advanced voltage monitoring and, and PCB monitoring. So there's a lot of different factors. All right. Um, so that covers that. Um, let's go ahead and go into the next item here. So let's see. We got uh, we covered uh, the two new um, boards for Threadripper and Threadripper Pro. We talked about the upcoming uh, LC, the 4070 Ti in white. So we've got the I gave you guys a little teaser on the RG thermal paste, and so I've got one other teaser for you guys. So I know that we've been seeing the hashtag chair for JJ, and I'm gonna go to my team and try to see if I can get my chair that supposedly they've earmarked for me. Um, in terms of finally getting me, I would hopefully like to have that SL400. I think that's a beautiful chair that we have in terms of our Ergo chair, but I've actually got another chair that we are going to be coming out with. So we are now going to be following up essentially the prior ROG Chariot and the Chariot Core, where uh, essentially we have two different lines of gaming chairs. We have our Ergo chairs, right? And then we have our kind of uh, racing chairs. And so this um, Atheon will be underneath the gaming chair lineup. This will be definitely significantly uh, less expensive than what you would see on even compared to the chair or to the SL400, but still definitely I think brings a high quality and some really nice attention to details. So. I'm going to go ahead and give you guys a little bit of a teaser of this one, tell you a little bit about some of the cool things that we have on this chair, and we will go from there. So let me go ahead and bring up the images for this one. Give me one second here. All right, so let's see here, and uh, yes, all right, there we go. And we'll show this size up here. All right, here we go. So this uh, will be coming out in the not too distant future. Um, so this is going to, like I said, be supplementing. It doesn't replace any of the current chairs in our lineup. It's just an additional chair that we will be offering in terms of our gaming chair lineup. So this will actually featuring a couple of cool things. So one, it will be featuring a 
do a design here. So that means that you have this material being actually a bit softer than this side material, which is going to be a little bit harder. That gives you a, a little bit more kind of comfortable position, also gives you a little bit kind of more support, especially for your kind of your thighs and for your legs. Um, it will also use a cold cured um, actually uh, foam material, which is also going to be a higher quality material, which will also maintain its shape and its form and its overall, let's say, kind of structural integrity for a longer period of time. It does feature an all steel frame design on this model. Okay. Um, it has a class four gas lift, which is heavy rated. Uh, some of the other competitors that are going to be in this same price band, which what I would say be chairs that are going to generally be underneath the $400 price point, sometimes have a subclass four or they don't have a class four heavy gas lift in, uh, built in them, but we will have a class four heavy rated uh, lift. Um, one of the other really cool things is the actual casters. So these actual guys right here, um, this is something we already did in the SL400, which not a lot of people even realize that we did, but we actually had a silicon dampener design and they were specifically actually tested for even lower noise output. And you might be like lower noise output. You know, I'd actually be surprised that one of the biggest complaints that a lot of people have with their traditional gaming chairs is especially on harder surfaces that the actual casters can be quite loud. So we actually have a kind of combination of a coating and then an actual ring material that helps to significantly quiet our actual casters down um, by a notable degree in terms of the actual DB output. So it's just a quieter experience. And you can imagine, you know, just if you're rolling around, like I said, on a harder surface, especially like later in the night, um, it could be just kind of one of those things that you're just a little bit more noticeable of and just having it be quieter is a nice experience improvement. Uh, there will be integrated lumbar support in here. So unlike the SL400, which has a more advanced kind of fully adjustable lumbar system. This won't be integrated in there, but you at least have some integrated lumbar support to be able to provide uh, you some support in that respect. Uh, the overall rating in terms of the actual weight for this will, I believe, be up to 300 pounds. So even individuals like myself, bigger people, you know, I'm six foot two, uh, about, you know, 220 or so, something like that range. Um, you would, I could comfortably fit there in terms of the weight rating. So this will help to accommodate a wider number of people. Sometimes some of the more entry level gaming chairs are up to maybe about like 225, 250. So this has a little bit more healthy room. That also is kind of aligned with the fact that we're using an all steel frame and that gas four lift, excuse me, that class four heavy lift uh, that we have in there as well. Now, one of the other things that uh, you may or may not notice is that this material that we have in here, this is going to be an actual uh, EPU uh, as opposed to PVC. Some manufacturers use a PVC based material. Um, outside of an environmental friendliness where the uh, the EPU material is quite a bit more environmentally friendly. Um, one of the key benefits in terms of the back area here, if you're gonna be utilizing EPU, is going to be that that material is actually quite a bit more breathable. Um, so if you're somebody that, especially if you're maybe a little bit heavier, or if you tend to kind of lean back in there and you're sustaining a, a lot of your weight, you're actually gonna be creating kind of like a little bit of a heat zone. And having a little bit more breathability there can be important because if you maybe are sweating a bit more for your back, it might feel a little bit hotter, a little bit stickier. So this inherently, just because it has a bit more breathability to it, will feel, I think, more comfortable, especially for more of an extended kind of gaming session. If you probably didn't sit in your chair for longer than 30 minutes, an hour, you probably wouldn't notice too much of a difference between the two. Um, they were both easy to clean materials. Um, but there's definitely an advantage in terms of breathability. So that's one of the reasons uh, that we decided to go with an EPU material as opposed to a, a PVC material. The recline range is also quite robust, um, where it does have actually quite a nice of a bit range. This is actually going to be soft, adjustable, of course, um, armrest as well in there. And so... I think that's going to be most of those items. So I don't have all the details for you yet. I don't have the confirmed MRCP pricing. We'll confirm all that, of course, when we get ready to release this in terms of channel availability. Um, but I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of a teaser here on the upcoming update in terms of our ROG gaming chairs. So this will be the next edition that we have. And I think it's going to be a really nice edition. Like I said, coming in at a lower price point than the Chariot, definitely a much lower price point than the SL400. So that's our highest in Ergo gaming chair um, with some still some nice touches right there. So that is going to be the Atheon. All right. Um, Namor, I don't know what the warranty period will be. We haven't set for it yet. Um, I would assume that it'll probably be the same warranty period as that we have for actually all of the chairs. So it's not one year. It's longer than that. Um, but since... It hasn't been actually released to the channel and we haven't set those specifics yet. I can't I can't actually tell you exactly what that would be. I would wait to essentially see what that information is once we actually release it to the channel. Okay. 
Kiari goes says, I hope you guys experience, and again, with external auto deck, uh, excuse me, external audio decks. Um, and I think we have, um, you know, it's a tricky balance because of course, so much of the market is now moving to external digital based DACs. Um, and then also even like on things like headphones, you even though I think in the high end segment, uh, the market, so people that are buying things, you know, like advanced like planner magnetics and stuff like that, you definitely are still using an analog based connection, uh, especially amongst a wide amount of the gaming audience, they're now moving over to wireless. So there's no physical kind of benefit to having an, an, an analog improvement in terms of the audio design. Um, they're using a USB based headset. So things like our ROG Delta wireless headset or our ROG Delta headsets are all higher quality DACs, but they're built all directly inside the headphone. So it's a very kind of complicated balancing act of trying to add value um, to something where there's so much shifting within the market. And then also trying to make sure that if you do offer it, that it offers a compelling enough value compared to maybe other offerings. Because there's tons of other companies that make great external audio solutions, right? So, um, you know, yeah, it's just a balancing act. It is something that our team is kind of reevaluating as far as maybe potentially offering a, a dedicated external audio solution. But we have other things we're also working on, like we have some external kind of streaming kit gears and some stuff like that that we're working on as well. So it comes out in terms of kind of balancing what do we think we want to prioritize focus on first um, as opposed to trying to do you know like 15 things at once right it might just be trying to do three things really well than trying to do 15 things and not having really any one of those really have the kind of attention to detail that we want to bring to the products right all right uh, Nelson goes is there a chance that this chair will come in white um, TBD, as all I would say right now, we do know that we've had some people that have asked even for the current uh, SL400 and the prior Chariot that they would like to see a white variant, considering that we do have a really robust white ecosystem, right? That uh, right now, ROG pretty much offers everything that we do. We have generally a white variant, right? So we got white chassis, white coolers, white fans, white motherboards, white graphics cards, right? White headphones, white mice, white keyboards, right? It's one of the only items that we don't, but it is definitely a challenge in terms of kind of just then adding even another product into that. So there's a lot of complexity to just kind of keep growing out the product portfolio, even if it just seems as simple as adding in another color choice. Um, but it is something our team is aware of, but right now we have no, we have no kind of committed uh, product release to say that we're gonna have a chair in white, but it is something that we know that we've gotten enough feedback that our team is evaluating for maybe something in 2024, okay? Um, yeah, so Daytona, that for that model, that's where we would say if you really care actually about lumbar support, actually we find that the cushions don't really actually work well at all. Um, they tend to be something that a lot of people end up throwing away. So that's the reason why actually if you look at our SL400, our SL400 has actually a much more dynamic adjustable lumbar system. So you can actually adjust the tension and the actual depth. So it's really, really nice and you can actually adjust that. So if you really care about lumbar support, then that's where we would actually say the SL400 is. So it's again, it's a balancing act, uh, of course, not only in terms of price and complexity, because it seems minor, but just adding more and more and more things to the chair, of course, increases the cost. So if you're attempting to kind of hit a balance of making sure that you've got something that offers a good quality, good design, good feature set, but also not offering stuff that's just superfluous. And yes, we could just add in a quote unquote pillow, but a lot of times, like I said, that, that pillow doesn't do anything. We found from a lot of users when we went into designing and developing our chairs, that a lot of them said they just ended up using what was included in there. Very similar kind of like the pillow headrest that they said, it was there, but I didn't actually end up using it all. So I ended up taking it off, right? And so again, if we kind of including it, we wanna to try to make sure that the usability level is actually fairly high, okay? All right, so that is gonna be a little bit of an update there. All right, guys, so I think we're gonna go ahead and jump into our GPU Tweak 3 with mobile monitoring demo. Demo, 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 demo. Pretty cool. <laughs> all right, um, so let's go ahead and show you what this guy is all about right here, guys. So uh, why don't you guys let me know in the chat. Um, is let me know, have you guys actually tried out GPU Tweak 3 or have you not tried it out? So uh, if you're not aware, GPU Tweak 3 is our essentially, it's not new anymore. We've now had it out for more than a year, but it was essentially under design and development for almost two years when we were replacing GPU Tweak 2, but it is our dedicated graphics card utility. Um, it is not a utility that you actually have to um, use ex with an Asus graphics card. It is actually 
uh, agnostic, so you can actually use it with any manufacturer's graphics card. It doesn't matter. Um, but it is our graphics card utility. Um, and we've consistently been kind of updating it and adding in more features and more functions. And uh, to be frank, I'll be flat out and tell you that if you've been using something like MSI Afterburner, I feel we offer a better utility, especially from a usability element. There's quite a number of really cool things that I think are far simpler to do within GPU Tweak, or they're just better under GPU Tweak than they are within actually MSI Afterburner. Um, and also there was a period of time last year that MSI Afterburner was out of development for more than six months, right? Um, and we actually had quicker GPU support because we have a dedicated internal team as opposed to working through a third party developer. Um, but with that, uh, this is the current build release that we're actually gonna be talking about. So this is version 1.6.94. I always like to note version numbers because when people talk about their opinion on software, if you're talking about like version 1.0 and you're on version 1.6, your opinion is somewhat valid, but it's not really valid anymore. It's like trying to say, I didn't like something in Windows and you're talking about Windows 7 versus Windows 11. There's a lot of Windows that have come after that and there's a lot of functionality and feature set that could be entirely different. So I really do think feedback should always be based on what is the current version of the software that's in the marketplace. What are you actually using? What's the functionality? And just here's some of the cool stuff that you can do. We're gonna to touch on some of the really cool elements in terms of what GPU Tweak 3 brings to the table. Um, so let's go ahead and actually bring up the software. I've got it on my demo system here and we'll get ready to jump into it. So let's go ahead and take a look at it. All right, so uh, for reference right here, this test bed, it doesn't really matter, but it's a, um, what is it? I think I have a Maximus Z790 Hero on here. Uh, we've got our dual 4070 base graphics card, our Tough Gaming LC2 AIO. So that's our new upcoming AIO cooler that'll be coming out. Um, and then I think a, a Thor, first gen 850 watt power supply or something like that. Um, but again, it doesn't really matter for the purposes of this demo because um, here the focus is just going to be on showing you guys the software suite and how this new mobile functionality works. So the first thing that I do want to go ahead and touch on in terms of the mobile functionality that is pretty cool is that this actually doesn't require an app. So you don't have to have something that you need to load on your device. Part of that means that we don't have to have like advanced continual kind of updating to the app if there's issues there. Um, so it's quite responsive because it uses your web browser. So it's really, really fast. It's low latency. It's really responsive and very, very, very quick and also really easy to set up. Okay, so let me go ahead and quickly take a drink. Let's head over here. All right, so Hi guys, hopefully you can still see me there in the bottom corner. You can see right here, we've got our demo system. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and bring up our GPU Tweak 3 here interface, right? And so um, we'll just give you guys a little bit of a flyover. Some of the cool stuff is that compared to something like MSI Afterburner, one, we have really easy targeted presets. So one, you have a default mode, you then have a one touch OC mode, which MSI Afterburner doesn't have. So if you just wanted to kind of easily just get a little bit more extra performance, you don't know anything about overclocking, you don't want to use a manual VF curve, just click that button, that's it. Now it's gone ahead and used a kind of an overclock profile that we've tested on many of our GPUs that we know generally kind of gives you a comfortable bump up in performance. It's pretty nominal, might be like maybe three or four, maybe five FPS. It's a small bump, but it's just an easy way to get a little bit more performance. Uh, then there's also a more targeted uh, mode that's of course for quieter operation. And then of course you have a user mode where you can go ahead and you can begin to customize all those additional elements, uh, whether it's gonna be the fan speed, the clock speeds, the memory speeds, the voltages is whatnot, right? You have all that information available to you. Uh, you can see really easy and, uh, toggles that you have also available to you there. Um, this is going to be a resizable UI. So again, unlike MSI Afterburner, you can go ahead and resize this. You have some more flexibility in that respect as well. Okay. Um, one of the other cool things is I know a lot of people like actually doing like stat monitoring and things along those lines. So we actually have a built-in OSD display interface. Uh, the cool thing about the, our OSD display interface is you don't have to use a third-party software and then go through a lot more advanced kind of customization. Literally, you can just click on the, uh, the OSD you can enable the OSD. And then the cool part is if you want to customize it, just go to this one tab right here and all you, you can just check off what you want to have. This is a lot more complicated if you're using Afterburner. You can literally just select which options you want to have within the OSD and that's it. But you can go in and you can make adjustments in terms of actually uh, what is presented there, the text effects, the information, the layout, and a lot of other elements. So you still have granularity and can control, but this is a lot easier to set up in terms of that. And then you also have an option right here for previewing. So you can go ahead and click that and you can see all the OSD information just kind of 
shows up right then and there, right? So very, very simple, very easy in terms of kind of setting that up, right? So let me go ahead and exit out there. All right. Um, you'll have links into some other uh, uh, supporting applications like RG Firmark, of course, Armory Crate, um, XSplit integration is there. We also have an exclusive partnership with GPU-Z. So if you want to have quick and easy kind of GPU readout information for your graphics card, uh, GPU-Z is built into our utility. So you can go ahead and have access to that information. And then of course you have your monitoring, which is going to be built into the card as well. And so then now this is where things are going to get more interesting. So we're going to go ahead and uh, Actually, I don't need to worry about showing that to you guys there. Go ahead and close out of this. And uh, let me reopen GP Tweak. All right. And so here, you guys, you can see we have the monitor. Um, some of the other cool things within the monitor as well is there's an option right here that you can see that it's called export and import logs. I really love this functionality because within the export and import logs is you can actually have like a stock and an overclock profile. You could export the log and you can import it and then you can look at the two files right side by side. Normally with like another utility, you'd have to like save screenshots, pull up the two screenshots or note them like in a notepad. It gets a lot more complicated to kind of try to do an easy compare and contrast. But here you can just take that log file, import the log file and immediately view the log file information. It makes it really, really nice. Um, but what I want to show you guys here is one of the really cool features, which is right here. This is the mobile view. So you can see right there, all it's going to ask me, it says, hey, can you go ahead and uh, essentially scan that? And that'll open up, of course, a web address on your phone. Once it's gone ahead and opened up the web, ad the web address on your phone, um, then we'll be good to go. So let me go ahead and now switch over here. One second here, guys. I'm going to go over to my other, my other camera. All right. And you guys will be able to see this. All right. So, oh. so there you guys can see we're actually now monitoring the system in real time. So this is pretty cool, right? Where you have now the ability that you can see your actual full system on display there in the GP tweak monitor. So now I'm going to go ahead and go back to my system, I'm going to start a benchmark and we're going to be able to actually see the information in real time. So let me go ahead and uh, open up. Uh, what do I want to open? Uh, just just be easy. We'll just do Final Fantasy. This is just benchmark and let me go back over here. And so you're actually going to see right already the frequency immediately went up there to you can see 2475, right? And the cool thing is you can go ahead and click on this and you'll actually see the graph readout. So you can actually see the graph readout for anything. You can just, um, you can go ahead and toggle that back, right? So you can see, you can expand on that. And it's quite nice, it's quite responsive there. Cause like I said, this is all just winning in the web browser, right? So you can see there how the TPU, the GPU temperature has kind of gone up, right? You can scroll through. You can see all your values are all presented to you right there really easily. Um, then you can go ahead and switch over into the column view. And then in the column view, you can see, uh, it's broken down. It's pretty much the same information. It's just visually whether you find it easier to maybe look at the information in the column view or whether you want it in the line view, right? And then you can also still go right here where you can go to actually rearranging the monitor where you can select, hey, maybe the only thing that I care about is I just care about. I don't want to, I don't want to see anything else, right? You can start to see where you could uh, go ahead and uh, you could remove essentially different values and you could monitor just what you wanted to, right? So you can see right there, I just got those two different points, right? So it's up to you to go ahead and define what you want. Um, you can also go back and you can rearrange those. So you can see right here, uh, you got that and you can you can move them around. So if you decided, hey, I want GPU voltage, GPU temperature to be up here, I want GPU clock speed. So maybe I want the GPU temperature all the way at the top because I want to see my GPU temp, then I want to see my clock and then I want to see my voltage, right? you can go ahead and adjust all that information. I'm gonna go back and re-enable those, right? And then go back and you can see just how quickly I've gone ahead and now set all that up. So really, really easy to be able to do. All you have to do is literally scan that. So it's a really easy level of functionality to be able to enable. So now if you wanna be able to do remote monitoring on again, your phone or your tablet, you can go ahead and do that. 
Again, it doesn't matter whether it's iOS or it's Android, it will work at the same. There's no difference in that regard. And you can see it's a really nice, lightweight, clean, responsive based interface. So I think it's a really cool level of functionality that you have available to you within uh, GPU Tweak 3, right? Um, so uh, Donta says, I want to see uh, VRAM temp. Uh, well, that's all dependent on the cards. Some cards offer you the ability to have a readout of information and other cards don't. So there needs to be a sensor for that information. Um, there's also some values that technically aren't quote unquote authorized by either NVIDIA or AMD. So sometimes some utilities will attempt to give you extrapolative information, which might not be 100% necessarily accurate, but they're reporting to you a value set. And so um, there's there's kind of just some variability in terms of uh, what information you're kind of providing. But one thing you can definitely always do is that if you ever find kind of a level of functionality or feature or something you want to do um, that we've been doing since we actually lost GPU tweak is that we have an integrated actually feedback system that's on the actual product page, uh, which goes directly to our development team. So if you ever want to send us any feedback, all you need to do is just head over to the GPU tweak three page. Um, you can go over here to this feedback tab and right here, you can pretty much just fill this little form out and that goes straight to our feedback team. So really, really simple. You don't have to go through like email. You don't have to do anything like that. It'll actually ask you all the specific information. It's very simple, really easy to do and allows you to make sure that you can kind of give all that feedback specific to our team. So I'm a big fan of that option. Again, you can just go straight in there. You can do that really simple, really easily. Um, OC scanner, yes, we have OC scanner built in. And actually, if you also want to do overclocking, our VF curve optimization is so much easier than competitors. Um, the VF curve optimization functionality we have actually has um, essentially kind of like a grouped editor, um, which allows you to have a much easier ability to kind of lift and reduce where uh, with, I'd say, other software to do the VF curve editing, it's quite a bit more tedious and quite a bit more complicated. So yeah, so the way that I kind of look at it is you have from a basic level, you have a standard kind of level of overclocking you can do with just clicking that OC uh, overclock button. The next step would probably be using something like the OC scanner. The third step would probably be more granular with just doing manual adjustments, whether you're adjusting things like the power target, whether you're adjusting like the frequency or the voltage. And then probably the fourth level would be more advanced voltage frequency curve um, editing, right? That's the most tedious, the most complex, the most time consuming form of overclocking, but generally it's gonna be the most advantageous, right? Uh, let me go ahead and just see. Yeah, so pain is going. I think you're talking about your point in terms of uh, overclocking isn't really relevant to what I think we're trying to show here in this demo. Here, this is just about monitoring your system and knowing kind of what the card is doing in terms of its temperatures or its clock speeds. In terms of what you're talking about from frequency, frequency is pretty much dependent on the GPU, right? Different GPUs are going to be hit different, different, um, excuse me, hit different targets. And then there also have other factors that you have to count for, like some graphics cards, say for instance, like our tough gaming graphics card could have a default TGP that could be different than the RG Strix graphics card. The RG Strix graphics card might have a higher TGP. So because it has a higher TGP, it also boosts higher, has a higher actually clock frequency envelope, right? And that's even independent of your overall kind of overclocking margin that is variable from one GPU to one GPU, right? You can't really talk in what you're talking about, which is gonna be very absolute terms. I'm saying that you can just arbitrarily hit one value across all GPUs. Most users have a really poor understanding of actually the real value that you can really hit um, because you just have too limited of a sample size, right? Some users will think I hit, I hit this with my GPU, so therefore everybody can hit that. And that's not really accurate. Um, we know actually we have a pretty good understanding of what we can see in terms of GPU range because we can test hundreds of samples. So we have a much better kind of understanding of really kind of where the relative range is per each GPU. That's also why when we set that one click OC parameter, it's actually a pretty good target that works for most GPUs. Um, because again, we've had a very good sample size set to know what we can generally feel comfortable with across a huge number of GPU variants. Because something that also people don't account for outside of even frequency variants, from GPU to GPU, you also have what's called leakage characteristics. So you could have, you know, 40, 10, 7, excuse me, 40, 40, 70s, right? 
and you can actually have some that are a little less leaky and some that are a little bit more leaky. And what that actually means is some are a little bit hotter and some are a little less hotter. There's generally a consistent control, right, that most of them are going to be within a certain range. But this is also why even when people an anecdotally kind of go in the community and says, well, my GPU is this temperature, is this normal? There can be a relative range of acceptance, um, but it can be hard to also feedback, right? Because the game varies. Some games have a much, much heavier, more demanding load than others. The ambient temperature could be different. Their airflow could be different, right? There could be so many different differences. And then even you could have the same exact system, the same exact game, the same exact ambient temperature, and you could still have cards that have a delta difference of, you know, five or six degrees um, just between just GPU to GPU variants, right? So there's, there's so many different factors. Again, that's the reason why here we just want to show you that if you just want an easy way to monitor your system, again, you can do that through the GPU tweak monitoring. So I'm just going to show that to you again, guys, one more time how that would work. So... Um, let me go back here to my demo system. Oh, sorry. Uh, we'll go back out, we'll exit out of the benchmark. Still here, guys. There we go. All right. So how would you guys guys do this? If anybody is joining us right now, if they wanted to see, all we did is we opened up our GP Tweak 3 utility. By default, of course, we have our normal monitoring right here. You have your full information right here. Of course, you have your importing, your exporting, your logs, which is really nice right again you can switch that into your column views right but we're showing you guys this mobile view you just scan that with your phone once you scan that with your phone uh, you then can go ahead and do what i did right here where you can see that it will then open up a web-based interface and then you can have a full real-time readout of your graphics card right and again doesn't matter if you have an amd graphics card if you have an nvidia graphics card it's fine and again, this feature works uh, regardless if you don't have an ASUS graphics card as GPU Tweak is an agnostic utility. Uh, we work on everybody, but of course, if you use it with an ASUS graphics card, there are additional features that you may get specific to our graphics cards like Fan Connect 2 headers or PCI power monitoring management or maybe more advanced voltage readouts or other things like that that are specific to our cards. So you can just see right there. If you also want to see a little bit more information, you can go ahead and click uh, that and you can have an expanded view on terms of additional data points right so you can see right there i can go ahead and expand out to that i can switch over to the column view and see that information and i can also go to the customization menu where you can select different items to monitor and you can also go ahead and rearrange them so you can see right here i can go ahead and move those up and down as i want okay so there you guys go that is a quick demo for gpu t3 All right, so let's go ahead quick and see if we got any uh, feedback that might have came up right there. Now make AC mobile. No, I don't think so. That's quite a bit more complicated. There's a lot more functionality that you would have to do into that outside of monitoring. There is a mobile component that we have actually already enabled in the past for AC though. Um, so it's not necessarily on the table, but Right now, the development is quite complicated because we have 35 million active users for Armory Crate. It's one of the actual biggest, if maybe not potentially the biggest uh, utility that's used globally amongst enthusiasts because it's used on everything that we produce, right? Our desktop systems, our laptops, our RG Ally, our motherboards, our graphics cards, our peripherals, our coolers, everything uses now this, um, this hub, right? And so... Anytime that we add functionalities, it can significantly extend the design and the development pipeline. So really right now our goal is to, um, one, maintain candidates with product releases, ensure feature and functionality stability to um, those devices as we add them in. So if we're adding in a cooler and we want to be able to control the pump or control the fans, or if you have uh, you know an extreme board and you want to be able to control the enemy matrix, or recent new integrations like for Z790, we integrated Game First and we integrated Sonic Studio all built into AC so you don't have to go externally into another program. Um, there's all kinds of other things to kind of bake in. But that being noted, for sure, I mean, if you have specific things, again, you'd like to see, feel free to go ahead and always send that feedback to our ROG dev team in the ROG forums. There's a dedicated thread for Armory Crate, which is monitored by our development team, and they can definitely, uh, you know, monitor the feedback. And we have kind of... Um, a pipeline, our pipeline in place where, you know, we have the different things that we're looking to kind of incorporate, you know, three months in, six months in, maybe a year down the road, whatever it might be. So we're always looking for, you know, feedback. Um, but again, I think the most important thing right now is making sure that we have a stable and reliable application um, that works well for all the different devices that are currently we support, which is already, if you think about it, the number of permutations are literally in the tens of thousands. There's tens of thousands of literally permutations that we have to already support. So 
um, you want to be very careful about just artif artificially just adding in a new function or a new feature um, like like something like that right especially with so many permutations that you have to account for all right all right so hopefully that answers that question so um, that answers that guys all right very cool so I think from here let's get ready to go ahead and go into the PCDIY Builder Spotlight guys. So if you guys are not aware of the PCDIY Builder Spotlight, this is where we'd love to be able to showcase and highlight your guys' builds from the PCDIY community, right? Um, so if you guys have not, how do you guys uh, send in your system for a feature? All you gotta do is be part of our PCDIY community. There's actually a form, you can submit the form and bam, you're good to go. It doesn't matter whether it's air-cooled, whether it's water-cooled, mini ITX, ATX, EATX, whether it's five years old or whether you just built it yesterday, it doesn't matter. Uh, of course, it's gotta have some ASUS hardware in there, but uh, we'd love to be able to feature them all. So feel free to go ahead and submit your systems to get featured on the ASUS PCDIY Builder Spotlight, as well as on our PCDIY website, as well as on our ASUS social channels. So let's go ahead and see first and foremost who we've got in terms of the PC Diet Web Builder Spotlight. I think it is going to be, a, 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 for me, definitely one of the absolute best builders in the game. It's going to be the one, the only, that's right guys, it's going to be Snef Computer Design. Um, you guys know that we have featured Snef quite a bit in the past, um, not only just from the work that he's done independently, but of course work where we've gone ahead and sponsored or worked with him on different projects. But definitely he brings um, just, I think, a fit and finish and polish and attention to details to his builds, which definitely puts him up there in terms of rarefied category of uh, being definitely one of the best builders and modders in the game. So let's go ahead and take a look at this build. And this one is going to be uh, his pro art base build. So let's go ahead and put that in there. All right. So first up, we've got Snuff Computer Design. And let's bring up the images here. Oh, I don't know if I want to show that first one off because that's like that's like already showing too much off there. <laughs> um, but I think it's okay. Uh, let's go ahead and put this in here. All right, and there we go. Okay, that's fine. Let's just jump straight into it. Here we go. All right, so let's take a look at this beautiful system. So. Right off the bat, um, you, of course, just can see just how nicely, of course, it comes together. This is definitely what you would expect from Sniff, but it's really, I think, in the details that really kind of bring this home. So one of the first things, of course, is that uh, the ID design for ProArt series is really refined, really minimal. It has that black and it has the gold accents. And so you can see right here, that's really what comes through is we have black and we have gold. Um, but I think also that gold has been really nicely balanced to complement just the little bit of gold that we have on the Pro graphics card and on the motherboard. But look at these nice little touches right here where you can see everything from like the screws, right? You have here as, uh, as a gold accent, even look the screws that he's got mounting in for the motherboard, right? Those are also gonna be gold. Uh, of course, you got things like right here where you've got some nice sheathing for the cabling, right? With just a little bit of gold accents. Again, a nice balance, nothing heavy and overt right here. It's really nice and complimentary. It feels almost symmetrical, but it's really pleasing. And it's actually just shows you that even before RGB, how you can use color, right? Just to be able to give you contrast, to give you some nice color, to give you some nice pop. And I think it looks fantastic. Uh, I really love also the openness right here where he kept this open, where you can see that the runs that he has that integrates over here into this backspace um, is really nice because it leaves this whole part of the motherboard open to give it room to breathe a little bit, to show off this nice kind of integrated shroud that we have, the nice little artwork um, there rolls over of course the memory and then goes in and slips into the back i really also do love this bits power block in there that two tone i think perfectly complements the look and feel of this build then of course we've got the horizontal profiling with that nice um pro art based graphics card which right now we have a huge number of models we actually go all the way down to the 4060 all the way up to the 4080 in terms of that um so there's a lot of different pro art cards fy if you didn't know Part of the reason why we make the ProArt graphics cards 2.5 slot is specifically for boards like the ProArt series. So if you want to have dual GPUs for acceleration workflow, that's actually one of the reasons why they're 2.5 slot, um, because you can actually fit two of them onto a graphics, excuse me, onto a motherboard to be able to do more advanced GPU compute based workloads. So that's the reason why we have a 2.5 slot target. The other thing too that you may not notice is that the ProArt cards have this beautiful black heatsink. It's one of the only cards on the market that actually has a black heatsink with most actually heat sinks generally being silver, which I think just, it adds just to the total look. But 
overall looks fantastic. Now this is where of course it even looks even better. You can see as we angle it and we take a look at the chassis, um, now you can really start to see where he's evolved the actual look and feel even further. And it looks really, really nice. So I love the transparency here that kind of he has tied into the front ties in with the transparency that we have also there on the IO shroud. I love the lettering. He's just matched that. That looks fantastic. And this is the same type of badging, which you can see right here, which is on the PCH. He's kind of mirrored the same type of design from here into here. So I love the way that that came through. It just looks really, really nice. So it's almost like pulling in that design from the board and then using that on the front here. I love the way that that turned out. Really, really classy, really refined. And of course, just it has that fit and finish and policy that you would expect from Sneff, all right? And so you guys can see right there, it just turned out really nicely. Love the way it looks. And of course, there's a screen uh, that is also visible right there. That team group memory also, some of my absolute favorite memory. I think my favorite memory right now for Pro Art Builds is this T create that's that's from team group that's their creator series memory i also i really like the crucial pro series of memory it's just black it has a really nice clean heat sink um so those are my two favorite dims when you're going with a kind of creator based build it is going to be the team group create or the crucial pro i also love how you can barely see the distro right in here right you know that's a really kind of clean level of integration just how it ties in right there And again, just, just a little bit of gold accenting, right? Overall, fantastic build. So let's go ahead and um, let me, yeah, I like that shot. That shot looks really, really cool. Let me go ahead and bring up his submission form and we'll go ahead and check a little bit more out. So give me one second here. And we'll see what we got there. All right, so there we go. And to bring back that image. Okay, so this is gonna be from Sneff Computer Design, guys. Uh, if you guys are not following us on socials, make sure to do that. One of the best builders and modders in the game. Uh, this was a sponsored base build. Uh, does the build have a theme? Pro Art tried to keep the great pro art design of the motherboard, uh, which I definitely think he did. What are three words that he would use to describe the build? Is elegant, high class, and clean. I definitely think all three of those things are definitely uh, affirmed here in the build. Does the build have a name? It uh, doesn't have a name. So what do you guys think? Why don't you guys let me know in the chat? What would you guys call this build? Let's throw up some recommendations right there. In terms of the core hardware, what did we rock in here? This build, it's a 3900KS. It's running the ProArt Z790 Creator. It's also got the ProArt uh, GeForce RTX 4080, so the highest in ProArt that we offer, the 4080 Marta. He's actually using the ROG Loki SFXL based power supply. So that's our SFXL based power supply, uh, 850 watt. He's then got the team group, team create memory on there, uh, DDR5, so 6,000 MT. Uh, team group, two terabyte, PCIe, NVMe, Gen 4, M.2 SSD. Pretty much all the water cooling hardware is gonna be from Bits Power. So he's got the Bit Power Summit M Pro Gold CPU water block. Uh, the enhanced true bass fittings, um, it's gonna be 14 millimeter. Um, the Bits Power DDC pump and DDC heat sink, which are also in gold. Bits Power uh, brass, um, Hard tubing is going to be in carbon black, and I think that carbon black hard tubing looks really nice. Uh, Leviathan slim radiator, uh, 360 radiator, and then cable mod is going to be the custom cables that are in the system, black and gold. Uh, and then he's got uh, seven fans that are in there, just pretty much a standard black uh, um, 120 millimeter fan in there. And then, of course, the case and the distro are both custom work that's done by Sneff. So he's actually the one that designed and fabricated the case and the distribution blocks that are in there. Um, what is he most proud of? The case itself. I really like the final results of the design and I agree. I think it just really complements this. I love the way that this front facade turned out and kind of has this nice symmetry with the ID design on the motherboard. So is there anything that he would change about the build for now? No, I'm sure I'll find something. No one sniff. He's a really creative individual. So I think he would probably, you know, he's always got something that's running around there in his brain that he might kind of tweak or try or want to maybe do for the next version, version two, version three, right? And how long did it take him to build the system? I don't count, but this one wasn't too long. Uh, and for comparison, Sniff sometimes he, he can take you know upwards of you know a month and a half, two months for some projects. So my guess would be if it, this one didn't take him too long, maybe a few weeks, as I would say, maybe like two and a half to three and a half weeks is, would be my guess. Um, 
And what is the system used for? Some a photo and video editing, Fusion 360, and controlling the CNC as well as some gaming. What's his overall one of his favorite features is on the ProArt hardware, he just overall loves the design, the elegance, and that really classy aesthetic. So overall, I would definitely agree. One of my favorite builds that I've seen, of course, from Sneff, but that is, of course, part of the course from there. So let's see what we've got for some recommendations, right? Uh, JC, he notes, amazing work, Sneff. Uh, Michael notes, uh, Black Beauty. I think that's nice. Uh, the only thing is we don't get the gold it kind of tying in there within, I think, Black Beauty, but I do like that. Um, Neymar throws out Timeless Supreme Pro Art. I like the timeless thing. That's kind of cool, but mm, uh, it doesn't necessarily work for me yet, 100%. Um, Old John Player Special F1 Colors. Uh, Chris S. throws out Dark Magic. I'm kind of liking Dark Magic because Maggot, sometimes Magic, you feel a little bit that you should see some maybe some sparkle in something. So I kind of feel that. And then the dark kind of goes to the, to the, to the black kind of characteristics. So Dark Magic, I'm kind of feeling, right? Um, ooh, Michael, he notes Midnight Express. I kind of like that because this is also a really fast system, right? You know, 4080, 4090K, uh, uh, excuse me, a, a KS series CPU, some fast DDR5 memory, some fast PCI MVMA storage. So I kind of like, yeah, you know, that Midnight Express. Yeah, maybe gold Midnight Express or something like that, right? Or the golden Midnight Express or something like that. That could be kind of cool, right? Um, so, uh, uh, we got a question there. Knight Rider, and then Mick, Mick Russo goes, Super Sneff Project. I like that. that. That's a good That's a good one. Um, so let's get ready to go into the next Builder Spotlight. Somebody was asking about the price of that board, so let me go ahead and show you right here. Um, and also, we do have a B760 version of that motherboard, so if you didn't kind of have, if you didn't want to go all the way up to the ProArt model, then you can save a little bit, and you can go with the B760. So I will show you both of those boards. So give me one second. All right, so first up right here, the uh, for the question I think is what's the price of that motherboard? You will see right here the ProArt Z790 Creator that is 469. It's actually pretty reasonably priced for this board. Keep in mind that you've got really nice spec on here. This does have 10 gigabit LAN and it has Thunderbolt. I think in this price range, it's one of the actual cheapest motherboards that you could have that type of spec because normally to get that higher spec, you'd have to go to Maximus series, which would be actually quite a bit more expensive. Um, you got four M.2 that's on there and that's dual PCI Express Gen 5 that's also on the motherboard as well. Okay, so yeah, so 469. And again, if you don't necessarily meet some of the specific CPU overclocking elements and you still want some really nice features on here, then we also have the B760 creator, which comes in at 250, which is another great choice that you have uh, in terms of a socket 1700 series. Or yes, you get a little bit less spec, but still really nice foundation if you want something in the Pro Art Creator lineup then you can check that out. Um, but yeah, we have ProArt pretty much across the wide range. So we have everything from a ProArt B550, a ProArt X570, we have ProArt uh, B760, ProArt Z790, and ProArt even in the AM5 lineup as well. So pretty much across all the chipsets, we generally have a ProArt based model. Ooh, Tech goes liquid gold. That's a, that's a good one too. All right. All right, so there we guys goes. That's our first one in terms of our PC Dowie Builder Spotlight. All right, let's see who we got next up. All right, um, let me go ahead and go into my list here. All right, I think next one is going to be from um, another great builder and modder in the game. This is going to be from PC Works, and I think uh, let me go ahead and see here. I think this one does. This one have a name? Ah, yes. All right. Yep. So let's go ahead and do this one. All right, I think this one's named after because of course anime, if you guys have watched Bleach, that's a really cool anime. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look at it. One of my favorite things that um, PC Works does is Mr. Tim Parker, um, that he's really, really great at is absolutely love his color play. His color play is one of some of my favorite things that he does. And I think he's one of the best guys out there that he really does a great job at painting chassis and really adding some cool elements. We've also seen some really cool painted chassis when it comes to the Hyperion. Um, you know, Stuart Tonks did an amazing job with uh, the Hyperion when it originally launched and he actually did it in two different colors that absolutely looks stunning. And this one, might even for me, I don't know, it's a tough one. I really like what Sewer did, but I love this color. My personal favorite color is like orange or yellow, kind of like a sunburst orange, sunburst yellow kind of vibe right there. Um, so this one, it really speak to me because I really love the color, but he did a great job. So let's go ahead and take a look here 
at what we've got here from our friends over at PC Works. All right, so let's check it out. All right, there we go. So right off the bat, um, loving the color theory that you have in here because we've got a little bit of everything, right? It shows you don't need to match everything. You've got black, you've got white, you have a little bit of that ice blue that's in there. You then even have red. And then of course you have that beautiful kind of sunburst orangey kind of color that's there. So I think all of them are really complementary and shows you how the colors all work together to create contrast, create some color blocking and some pop. Um, so really nice, uh, vibrant, um, but also it still feels really cohesive and it comes together really nicely. Um, so again, really love uh, the, also the lines on the Hyperion where it's got really bold and distinct stylized lines. So as we also go out to the front, we're going to see how this really also comes together. But some cool things you can see right here is that he's gone with different kind of sections to have different colors. So you can see the exterior paneling right here is black and then we go into this primary color and then we go into the white and then we go back into the black on the inside you can see more attention to detailing and painting that's gone through and then of course a really kind of cool graphic that goes on the inset right here on uh, the water cooling uh, layout also i like that he did go horizontal for the water cooling block and didn't go vertical the hyperion does support both a vertical and a horizontal mount but i think this is spaced visually a little bit more it opens up some breathing room breathing room in the chassis um, and it also allows you to see a little bit more between kind of the top the middle and the bottom so you get a little bit of color from here and you still get the black here so you're creating kind of two points of contrast and opening up some space plus you have this kind of cool flow through visual going from the cpu down here to this kind of integrated routed uh distro right so that's pretty slick as you move over now to a little bit more of the side view you can see that rear fan that wasn't there now that one's a tough one for me I almost, part of me almost would maybe take out the fan. I think from a symmetry perspective, it works better from a symmetry perspective that I like his choice here, where I really do like here, you can see the dual color design on these landing fans look fantastic. So I really love that you get kind of this color, <coughs> excuse me, that's tying through the chassis. And then you have this accent right here with the silver. And then that carries through on this side. So it has a very symmetrical kind of balance. The one negative that you have, though, is always is that when you put a rear mounted fan a little bit for some of the boards, you block up a little bit of the lighting there uh, just because it's just so, so close to it that it eats away to it that I almost kind of wish that it wasn't there so I could see it a little bit more. But I think overall for the theme, this works better for the theme. So I totally would keep it. I, I do think it makes sense. It's just part of me wishes I could see a little bit more of that. Um, but overall, I think that looks fantastic. And here, now this is where I think it starts to really even look its best, is absolutely love this color when you see it spread out across the Hyperion. That's one of the really cool things about the Hyperion. It has this bold, distinct skeletal frame design that also really fits in the world of anime. Like that's the reason why I think it looks so good for the Evangelion colorway, that just, it has that kind of just vibe that it looks like it should be in an anime. And this X frame just, it takes on color so well because it creates an inherent kind of focal point and contrast within that X. And then you have, of course, the secondary contrast color that I think looks really, really nice. So I love the way that this turned out in terms of the chassis look and feel. And then also the lighting too, where you can see that he's carrying through the lighting on the front with these little triangular accents right here with the RGB lighting, I think looks really, really nice as well. So the paint job, I just, you can just take, it just takes it up to that next level. It just looks fantastic, right? And just like right there, even if you didn't have the rest of the system, if you just had that, you gotta tell me that just looks cool, right guys? I mean, that just looks really, really nice. Um, you see those really nice big open slats right here this is of course those are those gold kind of wing doors where you can really just open up those doors you got the tempered glass side panel on there i love this color combination where you've got like i said this really really nice kind of yellow orange right um leading more into the yellow um with the black and then the blue i just looks fantastic right really really nice in terms of the overall look and feel and then look even more than on the back the back that, that whole back i absolutely love that so again just this, it's a really great balance in terms of the overall kind of just level of graphics that we have in there and the colors. It looks really cool. Like even if you're not an anime fan, I think this is really awesome. So you could imagine like even if you're not an anime fan, the anime fan in you would love this because it's like it speaks to the anime. But even if you only saw this and you weren't an anime fan, that looks really cool, right? So, you know, I, I see it could kind of kind of work in a lot of different ways. So overall, uh, fantastic work. Let's go ahead and take a look at his mission form. Um, and see what we got going on here. Let me go ahead and uh, open up a couple of these here to just see, let me, which one should I put? I think we'll put, 
Uh, let's put one here and then we'll put this one here. Okay, I think that works. Okay, and there we go. Okay. Let's do that. Yeah, let's I think that's those are two good ones. Okay. All right, and let me bring up his submission form. Okay. So there you guys go. You can see it from the back. You can see it from the front. You can see it with that nice angle right there. I don't think we got a shot there with the tempered glass side panel on. I think that actually would have been really cool to see how it looks even with the tempered glass on there where it just has that little bit of that smoked out kind of diffuse look, but you can still see in there and you see all those really kind of nice colors. I think that would actually look really, really nice. And also love uh, even what he did here on the memory where he didn't uh, synchronize the memory, right? He actually went with different accents four different dims. So two of the dims are of course in one color and then the other dims are in another color, right? Uh, no top view, right? Um, but let's go ahead and see right here what we have for the submission form. So let's see. Okay, so this is gonna be from PC Works from Tim Parker. Again, you guys, if you're not following him on his socials, make sure to go ahead and check that. Does it have a theme? Bleach, of course, uh, Bleach, a very, very popular anime. What are three words you would use to describe the build? Anime, Bleach, and Water Cult. Does the build have a name? It doesn't have a name. So what would you guys call it? Now, again, this is where if you know uh, Bleach, then maybe it would be maybe from one of the characters or something within Bleach, all right? Or maybe you just are inspired by the color or just by kind of the vibe that you get from the system. So let's see. Anybody want to throw in their recommendation for what they would call this system? All right. Um, so what do we have in terms of the core components? Um, very high in build. It's an Asus ROG Maximus Z790 Hero based motherboard. Then the water cool GPU is going to be uh, the preferred GPU that I would recommend, which is going to be for a tough gaming series. Specifically, this is a GeForce RTX 4080 tough gaming. Powering the whole system is also going to be a um, ROG Thor 1200 watt power supply. And then we also, of course, can see that the chassis is the ROG Hyperion. So that's our flagship series chassis in there. Then he's got Lian Lee fans that he has in there. And then um, EK, you can see for the water cooling hardware that he also has in there for the GPU block, I think the, for the fittings, and then also for the CPU block, and then Lian Lee Li Uni fans he has for the uh, RGB fans that are in there. What aspect is he most proud of? Is that it's going to be the black the back panel and I would agree that actual back panel is absolutely stunning uh, that to me though set off with the overall total paint job is fantastic is there anything they would change about the build the inside art interesting I wonder what he would change about it because I really like the way that the inside art looks so guys how long did it take him to do the build one week so really impressive for that amount of time um, what is the system used for it was of course for marketing related purposes his favorite feature or function he's a big fan of armory crate just likes to be able to have that one-stop shop to be able to control the system be able to control the lighting be able to monitor everything like that so some feedback from people in the community we've got Neymar says this is just art All right here h2o computer saying great build chris s is throwing some love saying nice Tech is throwing some love and saying, lovely paint job, right? I agree, I agree as well. Uh, Thomas is going, oh, nice. And Michael's also throwing up, very cool. Overall, I agree, really nice. Love the way this turned out. Definite thumbs up over for our friends at PC Works, man. Tim, fantastic job. I think it's great. And I wouldn't change the inside. I think the inside looks great. But I do think, I think the, the back is even better than the inside and absolutely is just set off by the amazing color that you use for the uh, Hyperion in itself. So overall, great build. All right, uh, let's go ahead and go into, I think I've got another one here. All right, uh, this is gonna be, let me see right here. I think this is gonna be from Tech Allen. Ooh, another another no name. So it's today. Today has been the the PC builds of no name. All right. So let's go ahead and take a look at this system. All right. See what we got here, guys. Ooh. Oh, I like it. I like it. All right. So here we go. So this one's pretty cool. I love actually the kind of the mix that we've got going on here. So a lot of times I think people, then they think white, you always have to kind of go with white and everything. And this is a great example to show you that contrast is your friend. You don't need to have a white motherboard with a white cooler and a white graphics card and a white chassis. No, you can actually use it to create contrast. You can use it to have kind of brightness and then you can use 
other components that actually create a kind of a pullback or contrast complementary effect. And so I think this worked out really, really nicely. So actually right off the bat, you can see this is our GT502, which is our uh, split chamber chassis, which is in white. We also have it in black, so we have both colors. And then you can see we've got our Ryogen 3 cooler, which also comes in white. He went ahead and did swap the fans. So this already comes with really nice daisy chain magnetic fans that are also in white, but I can understand that maybe just for a cohesive look, he went with matching all the fans. So all the fans are gonna be the same, right? So these fans here, these fans here, these fans here, they're all the same, uh, but this is the Ryogen uh, uh, 360 in white. Then we've got a pro art based motherboard and we have a tough gaming based graphics card. We have streamer cables and we have dims. Interesting, he went RGB dims and then he went with those also in silver. And I think it overall looks really, really nice. I like the way that this looks. Again, I like the contrast and I love even just the simple and clean RGI that we have there on the screen, okay? Let's go ahead and take a little closer look. The streamer cables, really nice in effect. You can see just that beautiful, clean metal shroud that we have on the, of course, Tough Gaming Base graphics card. Looks very, very nice. I love the straps that we have on the Tough Gaming uh, GT502. Anybody that's ever built in this chassis, you know that the straps, you might think that they're not useful, but I can tell you when you have to lift or move the system, it's really nice as opposed to physically trying to uh, carry a system from like the bottom. It makes definitely working with the system a lot easier. That subtle little lighting there on the Tough Gaming. And then right there, there's a little bit more of a view there from kind of the front, you would see it. I think both look fantastic. You got that nice kind of open frame right there, but I do think kind of split chassis designs always look best from the side as opposed from the front. You think that you look at the, the Hyperion, the Hyperion's a better example of having like a more pronounced front identity. So I think it looks strongest when you have a, a chassis that isn't necessarily trying to have like this type of design, like a split chamber, whereas split chambers, I think always look best from the side, not necessarily from the front, but this looks still quite nice. And there we go, I have a full on side profile right there. Looks really clean. I love, of course, that white because that white uh, opens up that brightness, just gives it a little bit more reflective reflectivity to the RGB lighting, which is quite nice. Some nice details too, compared to some other vendors, which sometimes have like a white chassis on the outside and then it's black on the inside or then still have black grommets. You'll notice that the Tough Gaming chassis actually has these soft gray grommets and even our internal cables are actually white. So you'll notice right here, like on our cooler, this cable's white. The actual USB cable that actually comes from the chassis is also white. So we've really done a lot to try to make sure that a, there's a lot of cohesion to the white experience uh, on our components. I love the way this turned out. It's really just a cool, clean build. Yeah, I got nothing to gate here. I mean, this is, this looks great. I love the way that it turned out. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at his submission form here. Give me one second to bring this one up, guys. So give me one second here. All right, so uh, let's see. This is gonna be the Tech Allen. And does the build have a theme? It did not have a theme, he didn't note one. Uh, three words to use to describe the build. It's gonna be clean, powerful, and versatile. I definitely agree. There's no name again for this system. In terms of the core hardware, we've got a very nice high-end system. This is gonna be a 13900K. It's gonna be a Pro Art Z790 creator. So we actually had two creator-based builds, right? With two very different looks and feels, right? Between Sniffs and then between this one. Um, the Asus Tough Gaming GeForce RTX uh, 4070 Ti. Uh, then from there, a Tough Gaming Gold 1000 watt power supply. So that's our ATX 3.0 PSU. The Tough Gaming GT502 chassis. The Ryogen 3, uh, 360 white edition. Uh, G Skill Z5 Neo RGB. He's running a, a, a 64 gigabyte kit at 6000 MT. Then two 1 terabyte VP4300 Patriot Viper PCIe NVMe SSDs, along also with the two terabyte 870 uh, SSD. Um, then Lian Yi Luni fans, the SO120 V2s, there's 10 of them, and then Lian Li streamer cables that are also in there. Total price bill, uh, total budget about this was about $3,800. 
What was he most proud of? The color combination. Uh, he really was happy with the way that it turned out. Is there anything you would change about the build? If there was a white Pro Art motherboard, I would have used that and a 4090 Pro Art if there was, but none so far, I would agree. But I think it looks fantastic. I really don't think you needed to go white. I mean, if you wanted to go white, you could have gone actually a couple of different routes, right? You could have gone with the RG Strix, like the Z790A, which I think would have looked fantastic in this. And then you could have also gone with a Tough Gaming graphics card in white, which we do have. We have now the Tough Gaming 4070 Ti, oddly enough, in white. And then we also have um, the Radeon RX 7800 XT also in white, which I think also would have been a great choice here. But I really actually like this color combination. I like the way it turned out. He put together this in one day. Um, and let's see, uh, what was the system used for? For production, especially... Um, uh, for actually interesting. So it's used there for like, uh, I guess like concerts, IT conventions in his country. So it's actually used for kind of the control center actually in an arena. That's pretty interesting. Um, favorite Asus functions or feature. He really is a big fan of Asus AI overclocking. So that's actually a great feature that we demoed in our prior stream. So that's the ability to look at the CPU and the cooler, know all that information, then automatically and easily and effectively overclock your system. He also really likes the screwless latch latching design for the M.2 SSDs uh, as far as being another feature. Um, kudos, man. Nice job. Clean, well executed. Nothing to note on uh, as far as any negatives. Mike goes, light speed. I like that. I like I like light speed. Uh, therefore, it has been named light speed. All right, let's go with that. Uh, Kevin is asking, when the heck is a 49-inch OLED monitor going to be for sale? It's been sitting on the Asus for weeks, but it doesn't have a buy option. That's because it, it hasn't been released. Just because we listed it doesn't mean that it's actually been released. So if you actually watch our PCDIY weekly streams or you're part of our PCDIY group, we'll actually have posts that say new products this week. Um, and that's actually when we release the products into our channel availability. So for the upcoming 49-inch QD OLED, it's probably going to be looking at a release, I'd say, sometime in November. So upcoming next month. Um, any specifics I can't tell you necessarily, and that even could change. Um, so the best thing I can tell you is just watch out. Uh, when we are getting ready to release it, we will have a formal notice in the PC Highway group, as well as here on our Friday streams, where we let you know about the latest products that we are releasing to the channel. So we'll talk about the pricing, we'll talk about the features, the functions, the design, and the overall channel availability. So in the not too distant future, though, we should be expecting to release that monitor, probably be releasing alongside also the ROG Swift 540 hertz monitor. So the world's fastest gaming display also. So we've got a couple of monitors actually coming out in actually Q4. So make sure to keep it tuned if you guys are interested in monitors. All right. So that's pretty sweet. All right. Very, very cool. That's going to be the Tech Allen. Uh, let me see if I've got one other build. Let's see if we can squeeze one more in here. So give me one sec. I think we can squeeze one last one into this list. Let me bring up my submissions here. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? All right. Just give me one second here, guys. I'm still sorting through my backlog here of, uh, of builds. But again, since we started off, if you guys want to submit your build, make sure to go ahead and do that. All right. So... I think let's go with okay I've got the build right here I think this is going to be from our friends over at let's go with yeah Pidgey PCs let's go with Pidgey PCs I think we've got a very cool uh, I think smaller form factor build from Pidgey PCs so let me go ahead and get that one loaded up here let me download those images quickly here, guys. Give me one second. Ah, perfect. This is the one that I was looking for. All right. All right, so let's put in this name and we'll get his submission form up and we'll show you your images. And again, if you guys want to submit your build for the PC Dial Web Builder Spotlight, all you got to do is just be part of the group, head over to the PC, PC Dial Web Builder Submission Spotlight link, and you can go ahead and do that. So let's see if this one has a name. Did this one have a name? Oh, it did have a name. Cool. Okay. So this is going to be from Pidgey PCs. So 
And this one does have a name, Wanda Wilson, Lady Deadpool. All right. All right, let's go ahead and take a look here at this build. And this one is cool because it's actually a small form factor. It's a um, micro ATX based build. It's actually in our, I believe in our AP201. Um, so a little bit rarer on the side. Uh, we do actually feature both micro ATX and mini ATX based builds on here. Uh, we've shown pretty much everything off on this channel. So uh, we don't restrict the different types of form factors. But as a whole, definitely micro ATX doesn't necessarily see as many builds as you would definitely see for, let's say, ATX, right? So let's go ahead and take a look here. All right, so here we go. So yeah, this is actually in the AP201. This is actually in the updated version of the AP201, which has the tempered glass side panel. If you guys remember, we launched the original AP201 with essentially the same side panel that you have on the back that's also on the front. So there was no tempered, gla tempered glass, 50, 57,000 micro perforations or essentially holes. I actually prefer that version of the tempered glass because I like that you have kind of a soft silhouette, even if you have things on the inside that are RGB illuminated that you don't see it. But I understand some people really like the just visual of being able to see through the system and see the kind of components. So this is actually the updated version, uh, but we also offer the same chassis essentially with just a full mesh across the entirety of this panel. So you can go either route. Uh, the cool thing also always generally about PCP, PG PCs is they love to actually share off their cable management. So they give us a rear shot, which is pretty rare. Not a lot of people are willing to always do it. Um, but here you can see he's spent a huge amount of time to do some great cable management. I really love that he used the actual nice cable management pathways that we have within the chassis. Looks really nice. Love the way that this actually turned out right here. Nice kind of integration here for the ARGB controller. It's nice and accessible. I like that he's got a combination between the hook and loop fasteners right there. And then he's also got his cables nicely balanced out. This is a really nice solid level of cable management. So I'm actually giving this a, ser a serious thumbs up. Uh, got no issues and contentions there. The only thing I'll say is of course here we do have, a, it looks like a few zip ties. Nothing necessarily wrong with zip ties. Just always keep in mind that zip ties, if you compress them too much, can actually pinch and damage your cables. So be very cautious using them. That's part of the reason why I don't actually personally use zip ties in my systems. I only use hook and loop fasteners. You can't get as compressed or as tight. I'm okay with that. That's just my personal choice because I never have to potentially worry about damaging um, a cable. Um, I also, you don't have to snip them if you ever want to make a readjustment, but really nice cable management. So nice big thumbs up to Pidgey PCs on great cable management there. So now we can, of course, see it without the tempered glass side panel. We can take a look at the system, and he's packed in a lot. Now, that's the cool thing about the AP201. It's a super easy chassis to work in, and it also has a huge amount of flexibility. You don't have any weird split chamber designs. You don't have any riser cables. Just a nice, big, clean, open space to work with. So you can go mini ITX, micro ITX for the motherboard. You can fit up to 360 millimeter radiators. You can fit in pumps, distros, all kinds of stuff you can see, even though you've got a smaller uh, chassis. And even if you don't go water cold, you can fit big graphics card in here. You can fit our 4080s. You can fit a 4090 in here. So very rare that you can fit a 4090 in a micro ATX chassis, uh, much less even a mini ITX chassis. But really cool runs. I actually really liked here that in his runs, he didn't cover the crosshair. Um, so this is actually one of my favorite boards. We don't make it. It was a limited production under the X670E was our gene board. The cool thing about this is this was an absolute powerhouse. It was the best actually... AM5 board that we made for overclocking along with DDR5 overclocking because it's also only a two dim topology. It's absolute beastly board, fantastic. And it also even has this cool Gen Z adding card, which is great for something like a liquid cooled loop here because imagine if you had to add in an M.2 SSD or do stuff here, it's a big challenge because you're gonna have to remove the whole graphics card. You'd have to drain your loop. It's a lot more complicated but with the Gen Z adding card, it's as simple as adding in memory, right? I can literally remove that module, add in my M.2 SSDs, put it back in place, and bam, I'm good to go. So it's a really, really fantastic design, especially for a water-cooled build. So even like our Apex, which we get a lot of overclockers, it's actually a great board for just general uh, ATX water-cooled builds, even if you're not kind of heavily overclocking, just because you get stuff like the DIM.2 adding card design. But I really like this black and this red. It's a classic ROG color combo. I like that the runs went over here, gave this some nice breathing room. I like that there's some depth and contrast, which is really cool right here, where you have these coming out uh, over the, uh, excuse me, coming towards you. These are in the back. And some really just kind of cool bends in there just to give it a little bit of kind of eye variance. And then of course you're mounting there also for the pump, right? Pumping the res, which looks nice. And then here, you guys didn't notice, these are our really performant, very nice high quality 
Strix XF120 fans. So those are our maglev bearing fans, some of my absolute favorite fans on the market. They sound great, have great airflow, nice static pressure, nice long cables, knows no ARGB lighting in here. This is all just about reliability and performance. So really, really like the way that this turned out. Um, I think this is actually the Jay's Two Cents Corsair block, if I remember right. I don't. I'm not. I'm not the biggest fan of this block block design. This like, mm, like it's like a little bit of a, I don't know. It's not like a camo, but it's like almost like a marbleized kind of, or maybe like a carbon fiber. Maybe that's what he was going for. And Jay's a big car guy, so maybe it was like a carbon fiber kind of look or something like that. I think this would have looked really, really nice with just a clean. Uh, standard block or actually even an RGB block, but then just illuminate maybe just the perimeter or something like that, but it works. I mean, the overall design, I still think looks really nice. The block doesn't take away from anything. And if anything, it actually gives it a little point of contrast. But for me, because I see such nice cohesive black here and cohesive black here, and even the silver accents, like part of me almost just wishes that this was more of a, just a clean, simple black block, right? Um, but it does give it just a little bit of kind of some pop and some flair that creates just something different for your eye to look at. So I could see how it could kind of go either which way, right? Um, do also really like the cables that are in here. These are look, these actually, I think these might be here. There are Tough Gaming Gold or RG cables because these have this nice soft waxy feel, which you don't have to buy aftermarket cables. They're just the nice premium cable that already comes inside the box. But I don't know, I could be wrong. <laughs> Let's see what he says in his notes. But overall, now we can see it illuminated. And there you can see, oh, that looks really, really cool. I love the lighting that we do on the Gene and on the Apex models too right here with this really cool lighting design where it's kind of underneath the heat sink and kind of it's coming through. I think that looks really slick. So I love the way that came out. You can see also right here, this is the Corsair GPU block. So you can see just a little bit of lighting right there, which is a kind of a cool little effect right there. Um, he's got the G-Skill memory in there. I think this little kind of cubed or kind of slant angular light right here and here would almost make me think that it would look probably a little bit more uh, kind of consistent if you also went with probably uh, Corsair's memory that has the cubed kind of the Capellix based lighting. But I think this looks fantastic. And also the benefit is if you're doing this, uh, Corsair is the only partner that requires that you have to have a third party software also running with Armory Crate. All the other memory partners, you can do native RGB lighting control. So actually, I'm a big fan that here with the G-Skill, you don't have to have any supplemental software, right? We can control it directly from Armory Crate. Um, I also like that he added in here. It looks like some rear lighting, which is pretty cool. It looks like he's got some subfill lighting there in the back, which is a nice way to just frame the board and adds just a little nice pop. So uh, very cool. Love the way that turned out, man. It's serious thumbs up. So let's see right here what we've got. So uh, tech notes. A uh, blood transfusion. There we go. Uh, Namor goes. G Skill has an app that you can adjust the colors. Yes, but you don't need the. They make that app for like third party. So if you, I guess, weren't going to load like the software from the motherboard vendor, but we can control all the lighting with Armory Crate. You can control the lighting for the memory uh, all within that. So you don't need the third party app. And actually, you wouldn't want to install it. You would just want to have one application there for control. Uh, Namor goes RG Red is a possible name. Chris S would also go Vampire Red. I'm digging that. That's pretty cool. And then PGPCs. There we go, man. Fantastic to have you here, man. Thanks. Um, I really love the way that you did it. I think you killed this. It's, it's clean, it's performant, it's compact, it's functional. And I really like that you just kind of, you didn't go too crazy here, right? You got some really nice bends and runs in there. But again, the kind of the focus on the hardware about it being just a performant, compact, fast system, I think is what really shines through right here. So let me go ahead and bring up your submission form. Let's see what we got right here. Give me one second. And we will go through your submission form. All right, there we go. Okay, so submission form. This is going to be from guys from Pidgey PCs, Ben Whalen. Um, you guys can also go ahead and check out his YouTube channel. So if you guys aren't subscribed, make sure to also go ahead and check out his YouTube channel. Um, does the build have a theme? It was a 4K gaming PC. Um, what are three words to describe the build? It's small and powerful. Definitely, this is a compact powerhouse of a system. Does the build have a name? Wanda Wilson, Lady Deadpool. In terms of the hardware, we've got the ROG Crosshair X670E Gene. So that's our micro, excuse me, yeah, micro ATX based uh, AM5 motherboard. 
a Ryzen 7 7800X3D, then the Corsair Hydro XC8. Uh, so yes, that's the Jace 2 cents CPU water block from Corsair. Um, he's got uh, 64 gigs of DDR5 memory in there, so that's going to be 6000 MT CL32. Considering this is a gene board, you could probably even tighten that up. You could go tighter. You could maybe get CL30, maybe even a little bit below that uh, if you want to manually time it, but that's already fantastic. I mean, very nice performance. Um, Samsung 980 Pro, two terabyte for the boot, and then he's got another four, two four terabytes. So yeah, so that's the cool thing about the gene board is normally on a smaller board, you might only have one or two slots, but here you have the Gen Z adding card too. So yeah, he's got three. So that's what? total of eight ten he's got 10 terabytes of ultra high speed pci nvme storage on there he's got a 4090 base graphics card in there that's also running the corsair hydro x xg7 uh gpu block then he is using our rog loki so the loki is our sfx l 1000 watt power supply and again those nice just soft waxed cables they look great they're individually sleeved and they have a nice level of malleability so they're easy to work with so kudos yeah uh, ben i'd love to see what your thoughts there is using the rog loki plus it's super quiet um even though it's a ultra compact based power supply um so he's got the Loki in there, the AP201, the tempered glass edition in there. Then you've also got uh, two different RADs in there, the XR5240 and the XR5360. Then he's got the ROG Strix XF120 fan. So I was right, those are those ROG XF120 fans. So here you can see there's the 240 RAD and there's the 360 RAD that he's got in there. And of course, because you got 57,000 holes in there, everything's perforated, so tons of airflow that you have uh, on that guy. Uh, the EK Quantum Kinetic, of course, 120 milliliter res uh, with, of course, the um, the DDC that's in there as well. Um, then you've got 12 millimeter, of uh, course, uh, uh, tubing that you got in there, uh, bits power, low file, some rotary fittings that are also in there. Um, the coolant, in case anybody's wondering, is Corsair Hydro X Red as well. And he did also go ahead and put a contact frame in that guy also. So total build for this build was about 4,300. What was he most proud of? Just being able to cram all that higher end hardware into a small form factor chassis that stays cool. I would agree, anybody that's built a small form factor system knows that that is a challenge in itself, but this chassis does give you a nice amount of room to work with and it's pretty easy to, to, to work with. Is there anything that you would change about the build? No. How long did it take me to put together? About three days, including the film time. So that means you guys can check out an awesome video. Check out the video on it. Um, system is hooked up to his 65 inch 4k tv and it's used for 4k gaming he's absolutely loving playing some snow runner some cyberpunk some starfield some gta and some elder scrolls his favorite asus function or feature is for this system in particular it has to be armory crate being able to get the, all the rgb in sync as well as keep everything up to date was just an easy win for me fantastic man um pgpcs i think you hit it out of the park man fantastic really nicely done yeah yeah, I would agree. Pidgey PCs, he goes, that's why I went with G-Skill, so I didn't need the IQ. And I would agree. Um, yeah, it's just, it's simpler. I mean, my personal systems, when I'm doing that, it's just it easy. I don't have to worry about a third-party program having any kind of potential issues. It's just more streamlined. So again, that's only for Corsair. Every other memory partner, Patriot, Kingston, G-Skill, Mushkin, um, all, of the, all the other partners all allow for native um, RGB lighting control. PGPCs give some feedback on the love key. Is I love the Loki. The cables are super easy to work with and do look amazing. And then uh, Michael, I think, helps to end out this uh, statement here. And I would agree. Red and black, you can't go wrong. Looks great, man. All right, fantastic. So that, guys, that's going to wrap up our PC DIY Builder Spotlight. Um, Hopefully you guys found it as always interesting, useful. You guys checked out some cool builds. I'd love to see your guys' feedback in the comments regarding GPU Tweak 3 and that uh, monitoring. If you guys haven't checked it out, check it out. Go to GPU Tweak 3, go to the website, download the software, try it out, try out the mobile monitoring. It works really great. It's a fantastic utility. We've been working really hard to be able to offer a great utility for those of you who want an easy way to tweak, tune, and monitor your graphics cards. So with that, guys, take it easy. Enjoy the rest of your day. Have a great fading night and enjoy your weekend. Stay safe and stay healthy. All right, guys, I will catch you in the group. Take care, and we'll see you guys next week.